In 10th place, we have loss of rights under marriage. Under English common law, a married woman lost her legal independence, she could not enter contracts or sue, and her property and obligations were mostly subsumed by those of her husband, the couple becoming a single legal entity. In less legalese, any property she might have had in her name, be it through a family holdings or being, you know, signed over, became her husband's and not hers the moment she signed her marriage license. Mm. Also, any personal property acquired by the wife during the marriage effectively came under the full control of her husband. A married woman was unable to dispose of any property without her husband's consent, and upon divorce, women generally had no rights to any property accumulated during marriage, usually leaving them uh, impoverished. Women were able to retain some property they possessed prior to marriage in certain cases during a divorce. Certain cases. So if your dad gifted you, say, a summer home for safety, and you wanted to divorce your husband and take back that uh, rightfully given home for your new home, yeah, uh, good luck getting that back. Besides the dowries, prenuptial agreements effectively allowed married women to maintain beneficial interest in her previously owned or inherited real property, which was placed under trusteeship, allowing her to have a separate income from her husband. Moral of this story, sign the damn prenup. In ninth place, we have a uh, lack of consent in marriage. So in addition to losing your rights over whatever property you brought into the arrangement, if you are a girl like me, consent and rights over your own body um, didn't exist. Marriage overrode a woman's right to consent to sexual intercourse with her husband, giving him effective ownership over her body. Honestly, just add it to the dowry list. Insert man's name here uh, is to be gifted however many gold coins, a couple of cows, the right to my land, all in the rights to do what he pleases with my body. Am I ever we're glad I live in today's day and age who have the right to look at that and say, uh, absolutely not. Women were expected to have sex with only one man, her husband. Just imagine a husband for me here, okay? On the flip side, it was acceptable for men to have multiple partners in their life. Some husbands had lengthy affairs with other women, while their wives stayed with their husbands because uh, divorce wasn't always an option. But if a woman had sexual contact with another man, she was seen as ruined or fallen and considered to have violated the marriage. Yeah, gotta love a double standard. Victorian literature and art was full of examples of women paying dearly for straying from moral expectations. Adulterous met tragic ends in novels, including the ones by, you know, great writers such as Tolstoy, Flaubert, or Thomas Hardy, as opposed to the modern possibility of happiness and fulfillment from adultery. While some writers and artists showed sympathy towards women's subjugation to this double standard, some works were uh, didactic and uh, reinforced the cultural norm. In the Victorian era, sex was not discussed openly and honestly. Public discussions of sexual encounters and matters were met with uh, feigned ignorance, embarrassment, and fear. One public opinion of women's sexual desire desires was that they were not very troubled by sexual urges. Even if women's desires were lurking, sexual experiences came with consequences for women and families. Limiting family sizes resulted in resisting sexual desires, except when a husband had desires which, as a wife, women were contracted to fulfill. To discourage premarital sexual relations, the new poor law provided that women bear financial responsibilities for out-of-wedlock pregnancies. In 1834, women were made legally and financially supportive of their illegitimate children. Sexual relations for women could not just be about desire and feelings. This was a luxury reserved for men. The consequences of sexual interaction actions for women took away the physical desires that woman could possess. In eighth place, we have purity culture. The ideal Victorian woman was pure, refined, and modest. Makes me gag to say it, but here goes nothing. This ideal was supported by etiquette and manners. The etiquette extended to the pretension of never acknowledging the use of undergarments, which would be referred to as unmentionables. The discussion of such a topic, it was feared, would gravitate towards unhealthy attention on anatomical details. As one Victorian lady expressed it, these are not things, my dear, that we speak of. Indeed, we try not even to think of them, in contrast to the modern norms of frank and constant discussion of, you know, details. Pardon me while I'm rolling my eyes here. The pretense of avoiding acknowledgement of anatomical realities met with the uh, embarrassing failure on occasion. For example, in 1859, the Honorable Eleanor Stanley wrote about an incident where the Duchess of Manchester hooped too quickly while maneuvering over a stile. Tripping over her large hoop skirt, she went head over heels, landing on her feet with her cage and her whole petticoats above her head. They say there was never such a thing seen, and the other ladies hardly knew whether to be thankful or not that a part of her undergarments consisted in a pair of scarlet tartan knickerbockers, which were revealed to the view of 
all the world in general, and to the Duke de Malakoff in particular. What a scandal. However, despite the fact that Victorians considered the mention of women's undergarments in mixed company unacceptable, men's entertainment made great comedic material out of the topic of ladies' bloomers, including men's magazines and music hall skits. Ah, there's that icky double standard again. In seventh place, we have denial of education. Women were generally expected to marry and perform household and motherly duties, rather than seek a formal education. Even women who were not successful in finding husbands were generally expected to remain without university degrees and to take a position as a governess or as a supporter to other members of the family. The outlook for education-seeking women improved when Queen's College in Harley Street, London, was founded in 1848. The goal of this college was to um, provide governesses with a marketable education because, you know, gotta have a governess. Later, the Cheltenham Ladies College and other girls' public schools were founded, increasing educational opportunities for women's education and leading eventually to the development of the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies in 1887. I'm great at entertaining the spawn of others, but I promise you all that I'm not someone you want as a mom or a teacher. Uh -uh. In sixth place, we have lower pay. Women cannot be expected to be paid the same wage as a man for the same work, despite the fact that women were as likely as men to be you know, married and supporting children. In 1906, the government found that the average weekly factory wage for a woman ranged from 11 cents over three days to 18 cents over eight days, whereas a man's average weekly wage was around 25 cents for nine days. Women were also preferred by many factory owners because they could be more easily induced to undergo severe bodily fatigue than men. Childminding was another necessary expense for many women working in in factories. Pregnant women worked up until the day they gave birth and returned to work as soon as they were physically able. In 1891, a law was passed requiring women to take four weeks away from the factory work after giving birth, but many women could not afford this unpaid leave and the law remained unenforced. This point as a whole is still, sadly, a reality in our modern day. Many women don't make the same as men for the same jobs and are expected to do more for less. Number five. Burke and Hare. Medical schools were offering a handsome fee for deceased bodies to study. This was, this is an odd time. So an unhealthy amount of Victorians came up with this new solution. They thought they were brilliant. Yeah, they would rob graves. They would just go and rob the freshest graves they could find. They would wait in the bushes until the funeral's over, and then they would go and Disgusting. It got so out of hand that family members were actually guarding the graves of recently deceased overnight. That's how bad it got. That's disgusting. But nobody goes down in history like William Burke and William Hare. They were an unlikely duo, to say the least. They wouldn't wait until the body was done living. You know what I mean? They would actually kill people and rush the process, all for a pretty penny. 16 victims in total between 1827 and 1828. It took 16 victims for people to start catching on to this weird plan. The pair would lose were victims into their house, fill them with alcohol, and then they would suffocate them. They had a sick system and they would suffocate them because the body needed to be in the best condition possible in order to receive a payout from the Edinburgh University Medical School. So they would, you know, try and keep it as clean as possible, which is horrible to say, but it makes sense. The Anatomy Act in 1832 put an end to this horrific plan. Number four, bird hats. Look, I don't have much to say about this next one here because, well, all right, yeah. I love a good hat. I've worn a few hats here throughout my time on Bumblebee, some baseball caps, some beanies here and there, sure. I've never worn a dead bird on my hat though, and I don't think that I will. That's for certain, I might just leave that out. Taxidermy was a hot topic back in Victorian London. Folks would rock the dead beaver or bowler hat, any animal they would just prop up there, and it was considered fashion at the time, believe it or not. It was a dangerous trend though long-term. Conservationalists were saying that 67,000 species of birds were all at risk of extinction due to this crazy dead bird hat craze. Can you imagine just a stuffed seagull on my hat? I'm like, all right, number five, here we go. It's crazy. Also, that's like a lot of weight, you know what I mean? A lot of weight on your head, just kind of, oh sorry, there's just a dead pigeon on my head, so my neck's kind of sore. What if the wings opened up and you kind of just like got some air? Maybe that's why they did it. Number three, holiday cards. Today, these Hallmark holiday cards, they go way too hard. And they also have a card for everyone and everything, you name it. Birthdays, weddings, stepdad's name day, you're like, what? That's oh, so specific. Like they have everything covered, but back in the 1800s, these holiday cards, they were brand new. Nobody knew what to write or say, so they would just end up sending these artistic sentimental scenes. It would be like a frog in a top hat riding a bike. No caption, just that. You'd be like, hey, Merry Christmas, I guess. It'd be like a carrot with a face. It'd be a haunting image, really, to receive from a loved one on Christmas, but it's the thought that counts, I guess. This holiday season, just give your parents a card with this on it and then see what they do. Don't even write anything. Just stare at them in the corner, all Victorian-like, and be like, 
Mother, father, merry Fortnite Christmas. I don't know what they would say. Number two, lots of arsenic. We of course have to mention a big problem in the 1800s, arsenic everywhere all at once, okay? Skin lotion, tons of cosmetics, it was a nightmare. Even if you didn't use any facial cream or anything, it was everywhere else. It was in wallpaper, it was in dresses, it was in toys, medicine. My gosh, it really was horrible, it's a nightmare. And it's because arsenic was cheap at the time. It was during the Industrial Revolution. It was being unearthed more and more, and finally, come 1851, the Arsenic Act was passed, which fixed a lot of issues. Yeah, we regulated that one, not soon enough, but we definitely got that one. Fast. And finally, number one, Jack the Ripper. Unidentified to this day, we've got to end on a horrific note. Everybody's just finding out now about Jeffrey Dahmer, it seems. He's a hot topic on Netflix. But what about Jack the Ripper? How did he get away with it this entire time? Why aren't we going to see a Netflix doc on him? Ever. Jack the Ripper was active in the East London neighborhoods, primarily targeting workers in the area. Now, at the time, the murders of five women from August to November of 1888 were believed to have been connected somehow to Jack the Ripper, although some sources claim that he was active even until 1891. Again, we're never going to know at this point. Many believe Jack the Ripper had some anatomical knowledge due to the way that he left his victims. I can't really say anything else because it's disgusting, but yeah, he knew some things, disgustingly. And while there were some suspects, including a member of the British royal family, believe it or not, Jack the Ripper was still never identified. In 10th place, we have deadly party games. So back in the day, board games weren't the massive industry they are today, and Victorians loved their parlor games, even more so when they risked their lives doing it. Because, you know, why not? One such game was called Snapdragon and involved pouring raisins into a bowl, soaking them in rum, and setting them on fire before scrambling to remove as many raisins as possible and chomped them down while they were still aflame because you know why not another game was called hot cockles and I couldn't make all of this up if I tried blindfolded and with your head in someone's lap party goers would take turns kicking you in the rear end and then you uh, had to guess who it was that kicked you this sounds not only uncomfortable from the start but like it could quickly get out of hand and my tailbone hurts thinking about it yet another game was called cellar stairs and involved walking backwards down a flight of stairs using a handheld mirror as your only guide supposedly the features of your future mate would appear in the mirror but it seems more likely that you would just, you know, fall down the stairs, and I know I would have. My balance is not the best. Finally, there's the candle and apple game, sometimes called Snap Apple. The game was so popular in the 18th and 19th centuries that Halloween was often referred to as Snap Apple Night. Candles and apples would be hung from the ceiling, and the goal is to get a bite of the apple without consuming any wax or getting burned. As a former altar girl who used to play with wax, youch! I can't imagine just how much that would hurt my face. Also, I think I found where uh, Ready or Not got its inspiration. In ninth place we have hats made from taxidermied birds. Not gonna lie, I'm not the biggest fan of taxidermy, even though I have a friend who has a museum in his home that has more than a few pieces. Granted, he mostly focuses on albino taxidermy. But, hey, to each their own. What began as a few plumes from herons, jays, and you know, pheasants tucked into the brims of headwear became a wildly popular trend, which the fashion industry capitalized on by going to the extreme, adding entire taxidermied birds to very tall hats, as well as stuffed hummingbirds to decorative hand fans. According to the Victorianist, millinery fashion took a truly bizarre turn in the 1880s, when hat crowns grew tall, offering a generous display area for, in the most extreme examples, an extraordinary array of animals, including cats and squirrels. I I don't even want to imagine the amount of flies that would be circling, you know, around hats that was still a trend in today's world. How warm things are thanks to global warming. Also, I rave for neck health since I doubt those hats were very light, and as someone who has worn a couple of very heavy wigs in my lifetime, they tend to take a toll. In eighth place, we have Victorian death photographs. So photographs of loved ones taken after they died may seem kind of morbid by today's standards, but in Victorian England, they were a way of commemorating the dead and blunting the sharpness of grief. Remember, unless you were rich enough to have a painting commissioned, there really wasn't a way to preserve visual proof that someone existed and how they looked for future generations. In images that are both unsettling and strangely, you know, fitting, families poise with the dead and consumptive young ladies elegantly recline, the disease not only taking their life, but, you know, increasing their beauty. Victorian life was full of death. Epidemics such as diphtheria, typhus, and cholera scarred the country, and from 1861 onwards, the bereaved queen made mourning fashionable. Trinkets of memento mori, meaning remember you must die, took several forms and existed long before Victorian times. Long exposures when taking photographs meant that the dead were often seen more sharply than the slightly burned living because of their lack of movement. On some occasions, eyes would be painted onto the photograph after it was developed, which was meant to make the deceased more lifelike, while other times death was a lot more obvious. Locks of hair cut from the dead were arranged and worn in 
lockets and rings. Death masks were created in wax, and the images and symbols of death appeared in paintings and sculptures. But in the mid 1800s, photography was becoming increasingly popular and affordable, leading to memento mori photographic portraiture. Try saying that five times fast. The first successful form of photography, the daguerreotype, was an expensive luxury, but not nearly as costly as having a portrait painted, which, like I said before, that was the only way you could do it first. As the number of photographers increased, the cost of daguerreotypes fell. Less costly procedures were introduced in the 1850s, such as using thin metal, glass, or paper rather than silver. Pricey, pricey silver. In seventh place, we have uses for arsenic. Pardon me, uses other than ending lives. But you know, that also makes me want to consider a top 10 creative ways to dispose of people. Martha Ponder. Arsenic invaded almost every aspect of life in 19th century Britain, leaving a tool of death and illness. A byproduct of an emerging smelting industry, arsenic was cheap and readily available as rat killer by uh, the early 1800s. It was also odorless and tasteless, and easily confused with flour or sugar or other cooking essentials. By the mid 1800s, 30s, morbid descriptions of death from arsenic terrified the public and became a staple of the British popular press. But most of the fatalities from arsenic were more pedestrian. From accidental use in food or from exposure to arsenical compounds in consumer goods such as fabric dyes and wallpapers in facilities that made these products and in the polluted air. Arsenic was used even in medications to treat everything from asthma and cancer to reduce libido and skin problems. Now Victorians were just as obsessed with their bodies as we are, if not more dangerously. Many women used arsenic to fight wrinkles and men swallowed arsenic tablets as kind of a pre-Pfizer Viagra. It's unclear if arsenic can actually be used to um, turn compasses to true north, but it doesn't seem advisable to try it. I feel like there are much safer ways to get a uh, motor running, if you will. In sixth place, we have wasp wastes. We all know that corsets were a thing in the Victorian era, but they were much more extreme than most people might think. Many women cinched themselves down until they had very tiny wasp waists. With super snug corsets that didn't just rearrange your insides, they made it impossible to breathe. Now, before anyone starts calling all corsets or stays awful to wear, they're only bad for your health if you're trying to accomplish the above improperly. As a gal who corsets often for fashion and posture purposes, I've only ever experienced discomfort when they weren't properly fitted, like when, or when I was wearing them for too long, or when I was wearing the combination of a too small steel boned one outdoors in the cold for too long. But this is a do as I say and not as I do kind of situation, since that was like a one time thing and my ribs have very much learned their lesson. Long story short, corsets are not bad, you just have to wear them properly. You trust me, right? Number five, hand stitchers. Yeah, this one's not as stinky, sure, when you think of these jobs, but it still sucked. With the rise of industrialization, many garments and household items were still hand sewn. Hand stitchers, again, often young women, they would sew clothing, linens, and other products using needles and thread. They worked in tight factories, overcrowded workshops, or sometimes in their own homes, often under poor conditions and for low wages, really low wages. The demand for hand stitched goods remained high as mass production techniques weren't widespread yet. It was close, but once sewing machines came into the picture, yeah, it eventually led to the decline of hand stitchers, which is good, right? I don't know, I'm torn because part of me is like, like awesome, they don't have to do that by hand anymore. Then I'm like, ah, their only job was replaced by machines. So I'm like, eh, I don't know. I really don't have this one. Number four, bone grubbers. Again, sounds like it's gonna suck just from the name. A bone grubber? What does that do? Bone grubbers were these individuals who scavenged animal bones for various purposes. They liked all the bones. That's all I'll say. They loved any and all bones. You can figure it out. They collected bones from landfills, battlefields, and even graveyards. These bones were used for making fertilizer, bone meal, bone utensils. Fancy. I'm gonna grab my bone fork. Cheers. And even crafting tools. Bone grubbers worked in poor conditions and faced controversy for their activities because, you know, they would uh, steal bones from fresh graves, so more than fair, I'd say. As regulations on waste management in graveyards tightened, the practice of bone grubbing declined and hopefully disappeared forever because, uh, yeah, stop. Yeah, thanks. Stop stealing my aunt's femur. Get out of here. Number three, chimney sweeps. These ones were horrible. Uh, this one really sucked. I'll say what I can here without breaking YouTube guidelines, but yeah, these lads here, these chimney sweeps, Sweeps, they were younger gentlemen. As homes and factories heavily relied on coal for heating and manufacturing, chimneys became clogged with debris more and more every day. It's looking yucky up there. Now, instead of an old man who's broken, they would send in these, again, young lads, quite young lads, 
Oh, I'll say. The shorter the better, right? Get them up there. Chimney sweeps would climb up narrow and dark chimneys using brushes and scrapers to remove all this horrible buildup. It was really not a fun time. Yeah, that's really all I can say about it. The work was dangerous. It exposed them to toxic fumes and the risk of getting stuck or falling. Well, that surely didn't help. Eventually, thanks to public outcry and legislation, this job disappeared in the late 19th century. Although I remember cleaning my chimney when I was younger. Hmm, I'm gonna call my dad after this list. Number two, a tosher. Being afraid of rats and the dark, well, this is quite impressive to look back on. A tosher was a person who ventured into the dark and filthy underground sewer system in search of valuable items. Anything, really. I mean, we're down here, anything good. Anything that's not soft, we'll take it. Toshers would navigate the labyrinth tunnels armed with a long pole with a hook in hopes to retrieve anything of worth. Coins, discarded jewelry, again, pretty much any other valuable objects that may have been accidentally dropped or washed away. Now they have it. Now they often faced harsh, well, rather disgusting conditions. Like, uh, for example, tons of human that's definitely down there for sure. Toxic gases, disease-ridden water, tons of rats, more human sh And given the era, there was a risk of collapsing tunnels all around you. So really the worst job you could think of in the Victorian era. Toshers relied on this hazardous occupation as a means of survival. It was all they got. Whatever you lost was all they had to live off. So what a terrible era, horrible job. And finally, number one. During the Victorian era, grave robbers emerged. Just all of them out of nowhere. They're like, yeah, yes, with their shovels. Due to the high demand in medical research, okay? You give someone a body, they give you some money. That's all they had back then. No paperwork, in and out, boom. With a limited legal supply, these individuals resorted to stealing freshly buried corpses, targeting the graves of the poor and marginalized. Yeah, history is so scary, so disgusting. Armed with shovels, again, just coming out of the bushes with their shovels in hand, with their uh, weird, I don't know, who does this? They operated at night, of course, employing various techniques to avoid detection. Obviously they did this like they were Batman. They didn't want to get caught because that's a little illegal. The stolen bodies were then sold to medical schools and private lectures. Public outrage led to the Autonomy Act of 1832. Thank God this was passed. This is a really fun one here. This legalized the donation of unclaimed bodies to medical institutions and reduced the need for grave robbery and established a regulated source of supplies. Instead of dudes just finding random people buried in random places and then bringing them in. That's, I'm glad we got rid of that. That's good. I thought dissecting a frog in science, I thought that was weird, but where those frogs come from? You know what I mean? Number 10 is chloroform the hiccups away. Nowadays, we know a nasty case of hiccups is curable by just holding your breath or chugging a bunch of water. But if this was 1899, you'd be prescribed chloroform. Known by many as the mysterious liquid on the rag placed over the, someone's face to make them faint in many period pieces or cartoons, chloroform gained popularity after Queen Victoria demanded its usage during her labor in 1853, after having been denied it in her previous labors. By taking these lengths to reduce the annoyance of hiccups, your vital organs may pay a steep price. Chloroform has the potential to damage the nervous system, lungs, and trachea, as well as the liver and kidney when exposed long term. This is just one of many medical remedies that we'll be covering from the first Merrick Manual of Diagnosis and Therapy, the oldest continuously published English language medical textbook. All the quack treatments in our list today used to be found in this mass encyclopedia. For instance, number nine in our countdown is smoke inhalation for asthma and other lung conditions. This may be one of the more counterintuitive remedies on our list, as it's easy to see now that smoke is not beneficial for asthma at all. Through the late 19th and into the next, however, inhaling smoke or smoke, as well as stramonium, a hallucination-inducing nightshade, as well as lobelia, known for its sedative properties, were popular treatments for asthmatics. Asthma is caused when your airways can narrow or swell while producing excess mucus. Smoking, meanwhile, has been shown to eventually reduce the number of cilia, the lung's filaments which help transport mucus into the lungs, which only leads to the worsening of asthma symptoms. This wasn't the only weird tobacco smoke belief, however. In 1872, an English newspaper talked of tobacco smoke enemas which even reported that hundreds of lives might have been spared by the tobacco smoke enema. Okay. Weird enough. Plasters, no not the British word for band-aids, is number eight. This medical treatment was said to have sucked the badness out of a person. They were like a nicotine patch made up of a thin layer sheet of wax as well as leather and it was able to stick onto the skin. In the wax there were remedies such as lead, opium, frankincense, tobacco, etc. This mix would be applied while still warm to ensure the adhesion of the plaster. Plasters were sold to anyone of any age and came in many different shapes and sizes so that they may be applied to different areas. Areas. What were they used for? Everything. 
cough, cold, period pain, organ failure, alcoholism, headache, the list can go on forever. Seeing as they wanted the patch to pull as much badness from the body as possible, these patches could be left on for 2 days to 2 weeks to forever. Without washing of course. Naturally these patches trapped in a lot of moisture that could cause infections, blisters, rashes and hives underneath especially once the patch is removed and the skin is finally exposed to air. Arsenic like plasters was a cure all and it's number 7 in the countdown. If you've seen our other video, top 10 unusual fashion trends from the Victorian era, you might know that arsenic was in everything in the Victorian era. Makeup, wallpaper, dye. No exception was made in medicine either as arsenic was prescribed for anything from anemia in Merrick's diagnosis manual to anthrax, cancer, reduced libido, syphilis, or even cholera. While it was most popular to consume arsenic, it could also be inhaled or injected. Being a byproduct of smelting, it's no wonder arsenic was everywhere during the industrial revolution as there was an excess of it. So it was incredibly accessible and a household remedy. Since doctors already prescribed it to do so much, everyday people just start to use it to treat any common ailment. Unsurprisingly, many people suffered arsenic poisoning symptoms. The ailments are now referred to as Fowler's disease. Number 6 is all kinds of gross and questionable. The everlasting pill. When the Merck manual was first published, part of the comprehensive treatment plan for an eruptive fever, which is a classification for diseases like scarlet fever, smallpox, and chickenpox, was actually laxatives. Castor oil was the main laxative choice for Victorians up until the debut of the everlasting pill, made up of a metal now known to be toxic called antimony, would be invented. Swallowing this would induce severe vomiting and diarrhea, thus giving the body what they thought to be a healthy cleanse, and their intention was to purge diseases from the body. It earned the name the everlasting pill, as the pill would pass through the gastric system mostly intact, meaning it could be retrieved and cleaned for future use. Seeing as the metal was greatly valuable at the time, it was quite common to keep it in the family and hand it down generation to generation. Imagine getting that in your granny's will. Watch out, it may shock ya. Number 5 is shock treatment. When profit can be made off of insecurity, unsavory business flourishes. Victorians honed in on the man's moral weaknesses as a cause for erectile dysfunction, and impotence was thought to be caused by either too much sex and masturbation or not enough. So doctors took a few shocking routes, literally, such as galvantic baths or bathtubs filled with electrodes, which were supposed to restore sexual desire in an advertised six sessions. For a more direct approach, a thin rod with running electric current could be placed up into a man's Repeat that twice a week, about 5 minutes each time and your little man should be ready to rumble. By the late 1800s, ads were running for electric belts aimed at weak men. They claimed to help cure kidney pain and sciatic nerve issues and backaches and headaches and nervous exhaustion and of course, mainly their dysfunction. While today impotence is recognized as the result of physical or mental duress, age or genetics, the belief that electric shock therapy is a useful cure for impotence still persists and some studies have shown positive signs. See that fellas? Don't knock it till you try. Try it. Speaking of electrocuting genitals, you can't tell me that didn't happen at least once with the first electric vibrators, which is number 4 in our countdown. Female hysteria became a diagnosable medical condition way back in medieval times when the concept of a wandering uterus, when a discontented or displaced uterus would cause a woman ill health, was first coined. Believed to have symptoms such as irritability, insomnia, fainting, anxiety, menstruation, or horniness, pretty much every woman showed these symptoms. Hysteria was pretty common. Doctors cure hysterical paroxysm and orgasm. For hundreds of years leading up to this invention, doctors were manually administering pelvic massages to women to achieve the necessary cure. But all that wrist work added up over time and doctors needed a break. So cue Dr. Joseph Mortimer Granville. He created an electric steam powered electromechanical medical instrument nicknamed the manipulator. The device allowed women to give themselves home massages to cure their wandering wounds and giving doctors the well deserved break they needed. A questionable cure for a very questionable diagnosis. Number 5. Queen Victoria's Name Change Every year on May 2-4 we set off fireworks then we have way too many hot dogs, it's the best. We call it Victoria Day, right? It's for sure called Victoria Day, right? Well back in 1819, Victoria was christened in an almost private ceremony. It was small, obviously. Victoria's uncle only let a few people attend. Like I mentioned in part one, she had an isolated childhood with the whole Kensington system that was no way to live. But even the day she was christened, trouble awaited. Her name was Alexandrina Victoria, and at the time, the name Victoria was not regal. It was a French origin, almost an odd name to have at the time, so she was immediately advised to change her name to something more 
traditional. But as our calendars can definitely confirm, she said, nope, I'm good. Victoria Day. Yeah, it's definitely Victoria Day. Number four, tattoos. I only have the one tattoo, but I've always wanted more. Just not so good with needles, you know? I got my eyebrow pierced and I fainted. It's a fun fact, I have a little scar there. Not great with needles. Some of the designs are so beautiful on tattoos, the amount of pain you all sit through, I'm impressed, honestly, mad respect. The tattoo craze really took off once Queen Victoria's son, the Prince of Wales, he went and visited Jerusalem. And of course he saw copious amounts of body art and was inspired. Inspired, we'll say, yeah. So upon his return, he was all about ink at this point. And the Prince of Wales, well if he has a sleeve, well then maybe I can have a sleeve, right? What's going on? It wasn't a sleeve, really, it was a cross. The prince got a tattoo of a cross in homage to the Crusades. So if you're gonna try and convince your parents to let you get a tattoo, just, you know, tell them the Prince of Wales did, right? You're just trying to be a royal. Number three, gym day. Believe it or not, they were around 200 gyms across Europe during Victorian times. Yeah, just like six good lives. So you're like, what? what's this about? Even Victorian dudes skip leg day. How great is that, okay? It's not just you. These gyms weren't bright, they weren't open, they weren't well ventilated, they weren't motivating, and definitely not safe. None of those, definitely not. No, Victorian gyms were reserved for the upper class, obviously. Grab your pocket watch and blazer, Ezekiel. We're doing squats today. These machines also were not ideal. They were designed as antiques first rather than their purpose. Also, half of these look like saw traps. Like, are you kidding me? No way I'd bend my arm around any of these devices. No way. All those wooden wheels? No. I'll stay weak and brittle. Thank you. Number two, ghost photography. I had to look back. I don't like talking about ghosts. As if the reanimated corpses coming back to life while they were ringing a bell wasn't scary enough. Yeah, let's talk about 1800s ghost photography. The camera was a hot new invention at this time, so tales of ghosts and spirits were now easily believed. Yeah, obviously, when you have a photo of a see-through woman, you're like, I, that must be, that's pretty terrifying. A big name in the ghost game was a man named William Thomas Stead. He was born in 1849 and Stead was the son of a Congregationalist minister and at the age of 22, he was appointed as editor of Northern Echo, which was a regional newspaper in Darlington. So far, so good. This British medium, Richard Borsonal, featured a photo of W.T. Stead and a real spirit. Yeah, imagine that. Imagine a day where somebody being awarded the Nobel Peace Prize also poses for photo ops with ghosts. You're like, I don't, do we believe all of this or none of this? What's going on? This is so scary. And finally, number one, music for eternity. Before we wrap up this wild part two, I had to include perhaps one of the creepiest patents of all time. Patent numero 9,222,059. Yeah, the number is going a little bit higher. This one got me thinking. I wanted to end this video off on this note. I like this idea. Maybe, I don't know yet. Music for Eternity Systems. Okay, this patent is not from the 1800s, but rather 2015. I know, it's not Victorian, but when else am I gonna talk about this, really? The idea here is that you could stay connected to your loved one by using a solar-powered digital music player. The best part here is the patent details how surviving family members now have the ability to update, revise, and edit stored audio files and programming after burial. Yeah, next Rihanna album, no problem, I got you. There's a speaker in the casket and there's a headphone jack on the tombstone so we can listen together and then we can decide if we hate the album. That's creepy, I wouldn't do this. Would you want this? Sound off below if you'd want, you know, big shiny tunes playing for eternity after you die. Number 10, mudlarks. Victorian London, around the 1840s, it was a bit of a mess. Yeah, a lot of sore throats, that's for sure. Everybody was sick all the time and the jobs that were available certainly did not help the cause. The jobs that were available had you catching rats and crawling into sewers. One of the worst jobs to have was that of a mudlark. As their name hints towards, a mudlark involved getting in deep in the muck that builds up alongside the Thames River. This one was reserved for younger folks, obviously, because it was like working in quicksand. If you were older, you would just get trapped. It was pretty sad. It was also exhausting, not to mention the chances of being washed away by the river were pretty high. All for the slim chance of finding a pocket watch, driftwood, rags, anything really worth your troubles. Number nine, chimney sweep. I remember when I was younger, I had to sweep the chimney in the house every now and then, whatever, and I personally, I loved it, you know? I thought I was the father of the house for a bit, getting in the chimney, getting all dirty and stuff, doing this, my hands on my, on my waist, I don't know, it's, that's, that's what a man was when I was younger. That little broom too, I love that little broom. I remember when I would do this, my grandmother, who is very English, she would be shook. She would watch the entire time. She would be taken back into time because this was a terrible job to have in Victorian London. I was 
yeah, it was not the same at all. Chimney sweeps were famously young. I can't say anything else there in regards, but yeah, they were we lads, to say the least. History is horrible. 1840 was a good year, all things considered, because a law was passed that then made it illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to climb in and then clean a chimney. Thank, thank God, I'm glad that stopped. I was 18 cleaning my chimney. I had no idea I could have used this great law. Been like, actually, mother, a lot of claws. Number eight, funeral mute. Funerals suck, man. I was a pallbearer like three times before the age of 21. My one arm is just strong as fuck now, that's it. I can lift anything just with one arm. I thought being a pallbearer had a lot of pressure, right? Victorian London saw many, many funeral mutes. Oliver Twist, one of those lousy jobs in that tale was that of a funeral mute. Funeral mutes were required to dress in all black with a sash while carrying a long cloth covered stick and your job would essentially be to stand and mourn silently at the door of the recently deceased home. Yeah, guy dies of a plague and you're like standing there like holding your breath like great, this is the worst job ever. You would then lead the coffin to the graveyard. So a lot of responsibility. Yeah, don't trip or breathe. Number seven, toilet troubles. Now the Victorian era was unsanitary to say the least, but it was also dangerous in ways that you wouldn't expect, right? Go to the bathroom and may not come out. One of the greatest Victorian inventions was that of the bathroom, but it took a few tries to figure out the whole, you know, methane gas problem. We gotta really deal with that one first and foremost. Spontaneous combustion of the bathroom was weirdly common. This would, uh, this is how, every time you take a shit, you were worried that you might just, Woo! That was horrible, that's so scary. Flammable gases like methane and hydrogen sulfide, they would build up over time with human waste. Human, a, a, a lot of human waste. Built up in the sewers and then eventually would back up into your homes. Next thing you know, you're lighting a candle and your bathroom's gone. Just like that. Now we have poo-pourri. You know what that is? You ever see a little spray and after you go, you just, you hide what you've done with one little spray at your friend's house. It's fascinating how far we've come. Number six, stairs. Yeah, believe it or not, stairs were a common danger in Victorian times. I'm somebody personally who falls up and down stairs a lot. I'm 6'2", I'm lanky as shit. I have like a Gumby body. I walk around like Woody. I'm always falling up and down stuff. It's horrible, especially in Canada. It's so slippery. I'm always, always slipping all the time. In Victorian times, I would have been doomed. Houses were thrown up comedically fast. There wasn't a Mike Holmes on Holmes to come in and check it out. There wasn't a building inspector that made things, you know, safe. Servant staircases, they were tiny. They were out of sight. They were built into these narrow walls, often missing steps that they had to and cut corners just to, you know, be narrow and out of the way. That plus a tray of hot soup and a lot of clothing, yeah, it was next to impossible to move around without something happening. A lot of fatalities and staircases. Even today, around 12,000 people die each year falling downstairs. Hold on to that railing. I'm here to remind you to hold on to that railing. It's crazy. There's actually no stairs there. I just made that whole thing up. Hit that like button for magic. Number five. Automatic smoking machines. When I read about this, I actually laughed my ass off for like a minute straight. I get some of these inventions or where these inventions were trying to go. Like an indoor saddle, sure, that's fun, I guess, if you want it to be. The mask at the time was thought to have beauty benefits. The automatic smoking machine was all bad. I don't see any good thing about this thing. It's not even designed well, it looks like sh in the corner. It was just a machine that smoked all of your cigarettes. Yeah, it smoked them automatically and then blew the smoke all over your curtains. What a great invention. Nice, 10 out of 10. Gonna review that. What a perfect addition to the family. This thing, first of all, was not small. It was not petite. It looked like a saw trap placed in the corner. It was so Victorian and scary looking. There's gears and pulleys and they're like, there's smoke pluming out of random places. It's like having a choo-choo train in your house. Who wants this? A choo-choo train that gave you lung cancer. Nice, score. Merry Christmas. Yeah, fire it up. It only takes 80 cigarettes at a time. I know. Number four, the surprise chair. Are you tired of sitting down on chairs that, you know, stay still and don't immediately topple back once you apply any amount of pressure? Well, don't I have just the thing for you? Here we go. The surprise Victorian chair. I guess it was invented for laughs in a world before Netflix. Sure, I guess. You have to be creative. There's no sign of practicality in this patent, so we're gonna go ahead and assume that these 1800s folks, they were hilarious. They loved a practical gag. I'm not even gonna say prank. Don't even make me say prank, YouTube. Not saying the P word. The patent shows the exact science here and what it takes to surprise your guest and then have them topple to the ground. I go, ah, ha, ha, then you bring them back up and then give them the real chair. This is a prank gift, and if we've learned anything in time, getting prank gifts, it only works once. 
So once you get your pal to take a topple in the 1800s, you would then have to store this heavy, antique, horrible looking heavy chair somewhere in your home and then bring the real chair back. Again, it sounds like way too much effort for a very low payoff. Imagine that, 400 pound chair. They're like, yeah, gotcha. All right, who next? Number three, toilet troubles. Now the Victorian era, it was, it was unsanitary to say the least, sure. But it was also dangerous in ways that you wouldn't expect. Some random poo-poo signs coming out of you. One of the greatest Victorian inventions was the bathroom. I love this one, it's great. Now it took a few tries to figure out the whole methane gas problem, but we did it. Yeah, spontaneous combustion of the bathroom was weirdly common in the V era. Flammable gases like methane and hydrogen sulfide, well, they built up over time with human waste. And more human waste than just, well, so much and gases, it built up in the sewers and eventually it backed up into our homes. Next thing you know, you're lighting a candle and then your bathroom's gone and you're gone and there's shit everywhere and it's the Victorian era and you're like, what do I even do right now? What just happened? What science was that? Number two, the wave rockin' bath. Seaside at home, let's do it. Are you tired of regular bathtubs that are stationary, relaxing and don't soak your entire floor in minutes? Well, the Niagara wave rockin' bath washes all that away. Yep, yeah, see you later. This bathtub was designed to rock, literally. It kept your blood in active circulation, apparently, and it only required three pails of water. Also a bull. The patent promised the fullest illusion of a sea or a river bath, whilst promising absolutely no water will splash on the floor. Yeah, good joke, no way that's gonna happen. And it didn't happen because that's way too good to work out. Imagine having this now growing up, are you kidding me? My mom would be yelling at me to clean up the floor immediately. I already made enough splashes with just a stationary bathtub. I don't want a, a rocking bathtub. I'm trying to rinse my hair, I'm like, this sucks. Everywhere. It's so stupid. Just doing this is so stupid. Looking at lights. Finally, number one, beauty patches. Oh, we need to bring back beauty patches ASAP. Imagine me right now doing this list with an 800s beauty patch. You'd hit that thumbs up immediately. You'd be like, this Victorian man is straight out of time. These patches came in all shapes and sizes. Now, even in this portrait from 1755, quite a ways ago, Joshua Reynolds painted Charles, the ninth Lord Carthart, rocking a large beauty patch. These beauty patches go way back. Also, look at him. That's a Lord right there with that He's confident, got one of those, he's great. Beauty patches in the 1800s, they were small, tiny circles, sometimes even hearts or stars, which is, that's pretty fun, you go. Now the reason for these patches, and sometimes having more than one, is because they were commonly used to cover up smallpox scars. Yeah, we found out your secret, you Victorian era gentlemen. They were made out of silk velvet and they were applied with glue, so if you pick a spot, you better be confident. The patches were dark black and they were also meant to make your pale skin pop, which again, imagine if I had one right now, you'd be blind. I'm so pale as is already. If I put one of those patches on, I'm going to be able to see the screen. You're turning that brightness down real quick. The position of these patches could also determine your political allegiance. Historian Joseph Addison took note of these positions when observing two political parties from back in the 1800s. One party had beauty patches on the right side of their face, while the other side had the opposite. Today we have uh, Twitter. Yeah, usually you can tell someone's political allegiance by just taking a glimpse of that. You're like, oh dear, no, that's, we don't wanna to talk to that guy. He's a, he's a right patch kind of guy. Number 10, rope makers. My arms are tired just thinking of this one already. Here we go. The Victorian era saw physically demanding work, especially, of course, in rope making factories. Today they have machines spin and get everything done in six seconds. Back then, you had to do it by hand. The job involved the process of twisting these fibers again by hand, typically hemp or other materials into these ropes using large manual machines. Now these workers, would feed the fibers into the spinning machines, which required quite a tremendous amount of strength and stamina to operate these things in the first place. Then the repetitive motion of twisting the fibers into ropes, and this took hours. This took tolls on their bodies, and of course, this often led to strained or pulled muscles. It's like a tug of war, but that's your job forever. That's a nightmare. The job required precision and skill to ensure the ropes were properly formed and durable, because you know, the town's construction sites were relying on these ropes to work. Nobody wants a lousy rope. I'm going rock climbing this week. Weekend, and I'm gonna think of lousy rope when I'm at the top. Get all shaky. Number nine, asylum attendants. When the dancing plague happened, you know, back then, city officials didn't call in medical experts, but instead they called in a band to play music while these convulsing victims danced. So when we think of mental health and how it was treated back in Victorian times and history, it's 
eh, not so friendly, right? Not so comforting, that's for sure. Asylum assistants, okay, this was a job. They were responsible for managing individuals with mental illnesses, some of whom displayed violent or unpredictable behaviors. However, these attendants lacked proper support and training, which left them ill-equipped to handle such challenging circumstances. And in results, it was all Oh, it was all bad. The attendants faced physical and emotional dangers enduring aggressive outbursts, attacks, and the lack of training arguably made these distressing and unpredictable situations way worse. Asylum attendants were like, hey, stop, what are you doing? It's like, that doesn't help. That's not how we do things. These attendants also worked long hours in overcrowded and understaffed facilities, making their job mentally and physically draining. The conditions they faced highlight the significant shortcomings and neglect in mental health care during the Victorian era. Yeah, they called them like mental asylums. You're like, can we change this up? Why is it so scary? Number eight, matchstick dippers. Just sounds dangerous right off the hop. I don't know why I'm doing this. I don't know why matchsticks are this big all of a sudden. Matchstick dippers. Just sounds dangerous right off the hop dipping a matchstick, what's gonna happen here? Matchstick dippers, these folks would often dip wooden sticks into a mixture of phosphorus and other chemicals to create matches. Someone's gotta do it, and back then they did it in a very dangerous way. Process of coating the sticks in the phosphorus mixture exposed workers to toxic fumes and harmful substances. Prolonged exposure to phosphorus led to a condition known as fossy jaw, which caused excruciating pain and disfigurement of the jawbone. Fossy jaw, they should make it sound less fun maybe, I don't know. Matchstick dippers predominantly young women suffered from serious health issues, including bone deterioration and necrosis. Furthermore, the work environment was loaded with fire hazards, of course, as phosphorus is highly flammable, science. The combination of toxic substances, long working hours, and the risk of factory fires every minute of every day made matchstick dipping a very, made matchstick dipping a very dangerous, life-threatening occupation during this time. Even now, I'm like, I don't wanna be anywhere near any phosphorus, thank you. Number seven, crossing sweepers. Back in the Victorian era, crossing sweepers were these individuals who earned a living by sweeping and clearing the streets for pedestrians to cross, right? Today we have the big scary thing with wheels, the big scary Decepticon looking truck that goes by and blows debris into your eyes, the spinning brushes. In the olden days, that was done by hand. Just one dude. Streets during this time were often dirty and filled with mud, horse, and other debris, just every, everything bad was on the streets. Crossing sweepers used brooms and brushes to create a clear path. Crossing sweepers used brooms and brushes to create a clear path, and in return, they would ask you for a small tip or payment from those who used their services. They're like, here, I cleared literal for you. How about a dollar? Thanks. They were especially common in urban areas where foot traffic was high, like downtown. Crossing sweepers were quite young. They were you know, really young, if I can say that, if you get where I'm going there. And they relied on filthy streets as a mean to survive. So what a horrible, what a horrible scenario. Number six, human alarm clocks. Halfway through, we'll get a little fun, then we'll get back to the weird stuff. Human alarm clocks, also known as knocker-ups or knocker-uppers, which sounds a little different nowadays, so we'll go with human alarm clock. One of the weirdest jobs ever. I kind of wish this was still a thing. I don't know, I'd apply in a heartbeat. Knockers, knocker-ups, these guys, they single-handedly provided a unique wake-up service during the Victorian era for phone and clocks and all that helpful stuff. Before the widespread availability of alarm clocks, especially among the working class, everybody who had places to be, well, a knocker up has your back. He'd come and smack your window six times and then run off into the woods. What a great job. I kind of want this job. They would use long sticks or poles, whatever, just to tap your bedroom windows. Tap your windows and scare you awake. That often works. Shoot out of bed every morning. That's great. Think someone's breaking into your house. These individuals were typically paid a small fee for their services, which is wild considering what they're doing. Knocker-ups played a crucial role in the industrial areas with the rise of affordable alarm clocks. The need for these guys sadly disappeared. But you know what? Let's bring it back. Let's get rid of alarm clocks. They're all scary. Get these guys to come and tap on your window. Hey, you have work. Get up. They're like, thanks, sir. Please get out. Number five, bloomers. Bloomers were one of the first styles of pants women gravitated towards in the Victorian era. They were worn in rebellion of the often unruly skirts of the day, which made it hard to move around and, well, honestly, probably do anything. Female cyclists instead preferred to wear bloomers, causing much scandal as people felt it was improper for women to dress so masculinely. How dare you? 
Basically, bloomers are like more floofy pants, is how I would describe them. And people felt that pants should be reserved for men to wear. Even the floofy ones. They were like, women can't have any pants, not even floofy pants. I gotta say, I would totally rock some Victorian era bloomers and be causing all the scandals myself if I were around back then. They definitely look more comfy than pretty much almost everything else women were wearing. The bloomers got their name from a prominent American feminist of the time, Amelia Bloomer, though she herself did not invent them, but she was a person that basically spoke out and was like, I, why can't women wear pants? Although Amelia Bloomer did fight hard for women's rights, she herself is not someone I believe we should just straight up glorify, to be clear. She also said some pretty terrible things about Native Americans, and she also seemed to be content with civilians taking the law into their own hands and literally hanging people deemed undesirable in their community. So it's a big yikes from me. Number four, corset. Corsets didn't originate in the Victorian era, but they definitely became iconic in regards to the fashion of that time period. That's because slim waists, they came back into fashion, baby. They also became iconic for the fact that they were causing great damage to the people wearing them. Well, I too, do love to don a corset from time to time. It is important to make sure that you don't push it when you're wearing them, and it's important to remember that this extreme form of shapewear literally has a history of moving people's insides around as a result of wearing them daily or even just regularly. Honestly, even me wearing it every now and then is not good for you. Just corsets aren't good for you. So even just wearing a corset, you know, every now and then, it's not good probably shouldn't do it. I probably shouldn't do it, but am I gonna do it? Yeah, probably. And even back in the Victorian era, when they were trending again, we knew that corsets were bad for you. And it made this item quite the risque one, despite it at the time being coveted and widely used by many out there. That was actually like even a topic back then. People were like, shouldn't people be wearing these? This seems dangerous. Number three, flashing. Some ankle. <laughs> can't see it on camera. I can't show it to you because it'd be too scandalous. So scandalous. As silly as this sounds now, especially with it being summer right now, as I'm talking about this, a time when being underdressed is really just being comfortable. This was, in fact, a huge thing in the Victorian era. Women were often covered head to toe from the top of the neck all the way down to the ankles. It was common for women to even wear multiple long skirts and stockings in an attempt to just fully cover their legs and ankles. So those who decided to flash a little bit of ankle with their fashion choices, whoo, they were considered quite risque. Number two, hoop skirts. As deadly as they were definitely fashionable during part of the Victorian era. The hoop skirt, also known as caged crinoline, was a type of skirt that was built like a cage. There's various different ones which were made out of different materials, but the idea is it's literally a big hoop cage that you wear and then you put a dress over top of that, or a skirt over top of that. The idea was to add volume to the bottom of your outfit, which would also help to make your waist look even slimmer. Something that was very fashionable back in the day and something still coveted by many in regards to modern beauty standards today. Hoop skirts though were deadly because you would often misjudge the size of your skirt, which could cause all kinds of accidents. Also, many of the materials used to build the hoop skirts and dresses that went over top were very flammable. Many people died from catching fire or getting their skirts caught in machinery or even carriage wheels. So yeah, don't wear a hoop skirt if you have to do anything or be, be near flames or just be alive in the Victorian era because there were open flames like everywhere. <laughs> number one, the one piece. I like that I saved this one for number one. I didn't realize I was doing that, but I knew subconsciously. The one piece swimsuit created quite the controversy when it, it came into fashion near the end of the Victorian era. And the really wild thing is it initially pretty much covered almost like your entire body. But, and it's a big but for this era, it was very fitted. So because it hugged the body, as swimwear really should do so that you can, you know, actually swim, it was considered to be quite scandalous. Not only that, but of course the one piece also wanted to maintain your modesty by not having your skirt float up in the water around you, giving everyone potentially a free show. So it was fashion to be pants, you know? Oh boy, a woman in pants without a skirt? Scandalous. Scandalous. How dare, how dare these women try to swim? We didn't say women could swim. Someone put a law so that these women can't swim. Kicking off the list at number 10, dark dining. I don't know about you, but I can't eat in the dark. I need to see every single bite that I'm eating, okay? Call me crazy. Part of me wants to go to a restaurant where you can't see anything, but I know that I won't make it all the way through. I can't do it. I like, I have a thing. I have to just, I'm not blindly 
What if it's not cooked? I don't know. Back in the Victorian era, dining in complete darkness wasn't just a date night. It was actually the best way to digest, or so they thought. That's why many Victorian era homes had their dining rooms set up in their basement. How random is that? Oh, do you guys have poker nights down here? Nah, just brunch. Kill the light. <laughs> what? How do you like your eggs? Turn off the light. <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> Number nine, saved by the bell. I'm sure you've heard about this at some point, but allow me to go into grim detail. In the late 1700s, cholera, bacterial infections, everything bad, you name it, it was all spreading. Not an ideal time to be alive. Many were biting the bullet at this time, of course being gravely ill, but with this came a dark trend. The safety coffin. Yeah, we got a safety, we got the safety dance, now we got the safety coffin, here we go. These coffins, I mean, God forbid you were buried alive, these safety coffins would allow the dead to rise again and exit said coffin. A lot of these coffins have extra comfort on the inside and of course, a wire. This wire ran through the coffin, through the ground and attached to a bell on the outside. So if a passerby or heard it, one, that would be so scary, but if they heard it, they would know something's up and they would help them out. Folks would get creative with their safety coffins. For example, a man named Robert Robinson from Manchester, he passed in 1791, but he instructed his family and watchmen to open the special door on his casket, revealing a layer of glass. Now, if anybody were to see condensation, he could then be removed. Patent number 81,437. It was actually granted to Franz Vester in 1868. It was an approved burial case, a real patent. This was a real coffin. This is crazy. This one had an air inlet, a ladder, and a bell. All three, there you go. The description of the patent says, if too weak to ascend by the ladder, he could ring the bell, giving the desired alarm for help, and thus save himself from premature death by being buried alive. Nice. You thought you died. Psych, climb this ladder. There you go. Good luck getting out. Now you're in an escape room. Enjoy. You only get two hints. It's like a little walkie talkie. Hey, uh, how do I get out of the coffin in room B? Number eight, no air. Now that song's gonna be stuck in your head. Jordan Sparks, a classic. Since we're on the topic of safety coffins, I had to include one more. Maybe two more, I'll never tell. This one is fascinating. The science involved here was honestly impressive. There was the classic wire and bell method, but the more sick people got, the more creative they had to become. Like for example, patent number 268,693, John Krishbaum's device for indicating life in buried persons. Yeah, an 1882 classic, we love this. We got the iPod Nano, they got the device O-Life. Nice. Upon first glance, you may think this is some type of medieval punishment, whatever, but really this device detects movement whilst providing much needed air. Now you obviously can't have a hole in the ground or else rats will make your real demise much worse than suffocating, right? So John's device here, as per the disclosure details, is that if the person buried should come to life, a motion of his hands will turn the branches of the T-shaped pipe upon or near which his hands are placed. A marked scale on the side of the top indicates movement of the T and air will then pass come down the pipe. Once sufficient time has passed to assure the person is dead, the device can be removed. Yeah, imagine waking up with this in your hands. I wouldn't be calm enough to turn it and then breathe in a passive amount of air. No way, there's nothing passive about waking up in a coffin. Number seven, bad hair day. Okay, you want it messed up? Let's do messed up. Hope you're not eating any food right now, especially not eating in the dark. Two red flags. Okay, the Liverpool Daily Post back in 1869 had readers invested on this fateful day. Right on the cover, it read, a 30 year old passed away in the village of Lincolnshire. Now at the time, that's not far off from average life expectancy in the 1800s. But this case was odd. Everyone wanted to read about this. This case was noteworthy. It was important that folks understood what took this young lady's life. Doctors asked the family if they can carry out a post-mortem and lo and behold, they found a two pound solid chunk of hair sitting in her stomach. Two pounds. That's what happened. That's how she met her fate. That's horrible. This ball of hair caused an ulceration of the stomach and ultimately caused her death. The woman's sister did note that over the last dozen years or so, she had casually been eating her own hair. So at this time I say, if you know anybody eating hair, send them this link. It's not a good idea. Cut that out. Stop doing that. Number six, the Great Famine. Weird time to talk about a famine after the hair incident, but okay, here we go. Back in 1845, a potato crop that a lot of the Irish population relied on was no longer available. This was huge. This is bad history right here. A group of microorganisms wiped them all out and in result, around 1 million folks died or had to leave. It was draconian law at this point and British ruling that made the exported food hard to reach people. This famine led to Irish independence and anti-union movements. 
Historical, definitely. Messed up, absolutely. Number In our number five spot today, we have the London Burkers. This is the name used to refer to a notorious of body snatchers who operated in London in the early 19th century. They were involved in the illegal trade of selling corpses to medical schools for dissection and study, and they would often resort to killings to obtain the bodies. The most infamous member of the gang was William Burke, who, along with his partner William Hare, committed a series of killings in Edinburgh, Scotland in 1828. They sold the corpses to the anatomist Robert Knox, who was unaware of their methods. Two of the group's members, John Bishop and Thomas Thomas Williams were convicted of killings and sentenced to death. The London Burger scandal highlighted the demand for fresh corpses for medical research and contributed to the passage of the Anatomy Act of 1832, which allowed for the legal procurement of corpses for medical purposes. Emphasis on the legal part of that, though. It's important. In our number four spot today, we have the Great Stink of London. The Great Stink of London was an environmental disaster that occurred in the summer of 1858. It was caused by the city's inadequate sewage system, which allowed raw sewage and waste to be dumped directly into the River Thames. The hot weather only exacerbated the problem, which is disgusting, and it caused the sewage to ferment and emit a foul odor that permeated the city. The smell was so overwhelming that it caused widespread illness and forced many people to flee the city. Parliament was forced to act, and a major engineering project was launched to build a modern sewage system for London. This project was led by engineer Joseph Bazalget, who designed a system of sewers and pumping stations that would carry sewage out of the city and into the Thames estuary. The construction of the new sewage system was a massive undertaking, involving the excavation of miles of tunnels and the construction of large pumping stations. It took several years to complete, but once it was finished, it greatly improved the health and hygiene of the city. The Great Stink was a turning point in the history of public health, and it helped to spur major improvements in sanitation and public health infrastructure across the developed world. Today, the legacy of the Great Stink lives on in the modern sewer systems and wastewater treatment facilities that are really essential for maintaining public health and environmental quality. In our number three spot today, we have Typhoid Mary. The Typhoid Mary case is a famous incident in the history of public health in the United States. States. Mary Mallon, also known as Typhoid Mary, was an asymptomatic carrier of the bacteria that causes typhoid fever, a potentially fatal disease. Despite being unaware of her condition, Mary inadvertently infected numerous people during her work as a cook in New York City in the early 1900s. After a number of typhoid outbreaks were traced back to Mary's cooking, she was tracked down and forcibly quarantined for several years. The case generated significant controversy at the time, with some arguing that Mary Mary's civil rights had been violated, and others maintaining that public safety justified her isolation. The Typhoid Mary case remains significant for its implications for public health policy and for the balance between individual rights and public safety. In our number two spot today, we have the Birmingham Riots. These riots took place in 1839, and they were a series of violent clashes that occurred in the city of Birmingham, England. The riots were sparked by tensions between two groups, the Chartists, who were calling for political reform and greater democratic representation and the authorities who opposed the movement. On July 4th, 1839, a group of Chartists held a rally in Birmingham's Bull Ring where they were met with opposition from local government agencies. The situation quickly escalated into violence with protesters and authorities engaging in brutal clashes that lasted for several days. The Birmingham riots of 1839 were significant for their role in the history of the Chartist movement, and it is said that the events of 1839 demonstrated the lengths to which authorities were willing to go to suppress the movement. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have the Brown Dog Affair. This was a controversy that arose in the early 20th century in London over the use of animals in medical research. In 1903, a statue of a brown dog was erected in Battersea, which had been used in vivisection experiments by a scientist named William Bayless. If you're unfamiliar, vivisection is defined as, quote, the practice of performing operations on live animals for the purpose of experimentation or scientific research. While I am all for the advancement of science, I do believe in ethical studies, and this clearly was not that. The statue was intended as a memorial to the countless animals that had been used in medical research, but it was met with outrage from some people. Anti-vivisection groups saw it as a symbol of animal cruelty, while some medical researchers saw it as an attack on their work. In 1907, a group of medical students attacked the statue during a protest, sparking a violent confrontation with anti-vivisection 
activists. The statue was eventually removed by authorities, but the controversy continued to rage on for many years. The brown dog affair highlighted the deep divisions in society over the use of animals in medical research and contributed to the development of new laws and regulations aimed at protecting animal welfare. Number 10, the fuzzy wonder. Growing up, I had the classic red toy car. It was great. I would honk the horn, slam the door with attitude, wearing a diaper. It was the perfect invention for a youngin like me. But back in the Victorian era, the toys or whatever, not as fun. Definitely not as fun. Fisher Price wasn't born yet, so if you wanted to wheel around and kill time, maybe even have a few laughs, well, you had to use this. The Fuzzy Wonder. Yeah, this, uh, let's unpack this one, shall we? This patent, I'll be honest, this patent here makes me think. It makes me wonder more than anything. Why didn't this change history? Are you kidding me? The fuzzy seat, the gears, the foot straps, the possibilities are endless with the Fuzzy Wonder. The only thing that we do know about this patent, the only hint as to who or what this was for is written right below the product's name. It says, the Fuzzy Wonder, the champion of his species. His species? You're telling me there's more of these? Where's the fuzzy champion? Let's take him for a spin. He's probably got an engine. It's probably great. I go shopping, riding one of these for sure. Definitely wheeling around, throwing stuff in. Easy. Number nine, top hat cigar holders. Yeah, this one here is so Victorian. I love it. In the Victorian era, smoking cigars was a popular pastime amongst wealthy men. If you were rich, you had to smoke cigars all day, every day, and then cough nonstop. Cigar holders, of course, were used to prevent the cigar smoke from directly entering the smoker's mouth and to keep the cigar cool and on your persons. There were various types of cigar holders during the Victorian era, ranging from simple wooden or metal tubes to more elaborate designs made of ivory, silver, or sometimes gold, fancy schmancy. Some holders were designed to be attached at the end of a walking stick, while others could be worn as a pendant on a chain, or in this case, for some reason, a top hat. Yeah, why is there smoke coming from that man's head? I wonder if he's okay. Oh, he's just bad. That's cool, my mistake, sir. Continue on with your Victorian cigar stroll. Yeah, people's heads were smoking. They would keep all of them lit on their top hat. What a weird place to hold them. Cigar holders were often personalized with the owner's initials or family crest, and they were considered a status symbol although it looked ridiculous on a top hat. This was a way to flex your wealth, you know what I mean? There were no broke boys walking around with top hats, no way. Or cigar holders on said top hats. No way, that's insane. That's a lot of weight on a hat. I'd be, I'd be doing this a lot. Number eight, the fork and knife cleaner. In theory, in the Victorian era, this one sounds great, but it also seems like way more effort than just hand washing, you know? I don't know, let's talk about it. Invented in 1850 by Thomas Parker in Kensington, the knife and fork cleaner in the 1850s, it was pretty significant. It was the big improvement in the process of cleaning cutlery, a bit, I guess. Prior to this invention, cleaning knives and forks was a time-consuming and often challenging task. Definitely harder than it is today to wash a dish. The knife and fork cleaner consisted of a handheld device with multiple bristles and brushes and gears that would all fit around the knife or the fork, and then it would spin and move around. Again, looks like a saw trap. The user would then rub the utensil back and forth through the bristles to remove any food or debris. It took a while, and like I'm saying, a little bit more effort, probably. This the invention was particularly used for commercial kitchens where large quantities of cutlery needed to be cleaned quickly, so restaurants, whatever. It was also popular among households, even though it didn't last too long. It's definitely worth a mention. It looks scary more than anything. I wouldn't be like, ugh, cleaning my fork, like don't eat my arm, thank you. Number seven, Vigor's horse action saddle. All right, now we're into it, here we go. I mentioned the fuzzy wonder earlier. This thing here, Vigor's horse action saddle. Yeah, action saddle, We've got some action here, there we go. This saddle would sit somewhere in your home, ideally in a place where no one else could see you. That's great, that's a start. The way they marketed this thing back then, they made it sound like it was an actual health benefit riding this <laughs> big vibrator, for lack of a better term. That's all it did, it would just vibrated and you sat on it. That's all I'll say, that's all I'm allowed to say. On the patent, it states that Vigor's horse action saddle can promote good spirits, it quickens circulation, it stimulates the liver, and probably other places, and it even creates an appetite. Yeah, all that and a thing that shakes you up in the corner of your house. Imagine it's the Victorian era and you have to watch your drunk uncles take turns riding this thing all weekend long. This is far too intimate for the family room. This is kind of gross. Yeah, it vibrates a lot and really hard, so that's it. You can do the rest. You can think the rest of the thoughts, dirty freaks. Number six, the toilet mask. Madame Rowley's toilet mask. Okay, where do I even begin with this one? At first, I thought that this was a mask that you had to wear while you took a I mean, Compared to everything else on this list, I was like, yeah, sure. People would wear the Phantom of the Opera masks every time they had to go to the washroom. Probably, who knows, they were weird back then. A toilet mask was not that. I mean, 
not too far from that. The toilet mask was a natural beautifier for bleaching and preserving your skin. <laughs> Victorian bleach. Easy, that's fun. The patent even stated that this mask would remove complexion imperfections. Complexion imperfections, see you later. Huh, what a treat, how lucky are we? All you have to do is wear this mask three times a week. For how long? I don't know, doesn't say. Just feel it out, I guess. Just feel out the bleach. Turns out lead cosmetics pasted onto a mask and bleach. Turns out it was not beneficial for your health at all. Who knew? Not me. Ah, uh, yes, let me put on my bleach mask before, well, I can't breathe or see anymore. Never mind, I'm gonna stop wearing that. Victorians actually like to collect weird stuff so much they made curiosity cabinets. Victorians were curious people with an interest in nature, the sciences, anatomy, botany, and morbidity. And for the upper class citizens, collecting scientific objects showed they were sophisticated and educated, often displaying their collections in a curiosity cabinet. These German cabinets were a way for the wealthy to show off their hobby. Oftentimes, beautiful wooden display cases with elaborate carvings and glass fronts, or a larger, narrow, open shelving style bookcase. Curiosity cabinets were usually kept in places where guests could see them to stir conversations about the pieces. And collecting was a social activity that allowed you to share your interests and also show off what you knew in a humble manner. Many curiosity cabinets were eclectic, filled to the brim with unrelated mixed oddities. Although most collectors were not formally trained, this never deterred anyone and even working class people start collecting items like buttons, fetishes, pocket sized portraits, stones and animal bones. Death, insect and human oddity photographs were as popular as Pokemon. Even oddity performers made business cards called carte de viste, a small photograph card collectible of themselves. Joseph Merrick, a professional showman known as the Elephant Man, was a popular carte de viste. And he worked for the next topic on the list, the freak shows. It was a weirdly massive part of the Victorian culture described as a family friendly commercial event. They were the entertainment pinnacle. The name itself is offensive and many Victorians even then boycotted the shows for its mockery and ableism. But the shows acted as a source of solace for performers that were often disabled or had genetic differences that made them potentially rejectable from society and potentially their own families. In the Victorian era, asylums were hellish and if that was your option or a job in the circus, many made the choice to live in a welcoming community of similarly ostracized people with differences. Siamese twins, extra limbs, excessive hair growth, malformations, Formation, and many married and had children and functioning lives of normalcy despite making a living performing for audiences as freaks. Their stories embody the magnificent resiliency of human spirit and they make a killing off the lustuous need for weirdness in the Victorian era, emptying wallets of people who wouldn't accept them outside of a show ring and living more financially secure than they did. The show started in the 1500s but hit their boom in the 1800s and the best performers were often found in Queen Victoria's own court. Some famous names were Millie and Christine McCoy, John Merrick, Fanny Mills, Prince Rondian, and Ella Harper. Next up is how Victorian oddity obsession literally irreparably destroyed a ton of history. Egyptomania. It began in 1798 with the launch of Napoleon's campaigns in Egypt and Syria, a fitting example of imperialism when they find the Rosetta Stone. Europe goes on a mission to proliferate and appropriate any and all Egyptian antiquity or aesthetic culture vulture style. The Egyptian obsession consumed Western thought, revealing itself through their literature, art, and culture at the time. This included their mummy unwrapping parties and novels such as Arthur Conan Doyle's Lot 249 and also their decor. Anyone who could afford to travel to Egypt could realistically afford to buy a mummy because they kind of sold them at bazaars like Barbies at Walmart. When it came to mummy unwrapping parties, Victorians let their intrigue cloud their, let's see, judgment, human decency, morals, conscious, man am I missing anything? It was a form of entertainment that was a complete desecration of Egypt, its people and their ancestors. Thomas Pettigrew who was a surgeon, antiquary, and an author, was a well-known unroller at one notable gathering for the unwrapping of Neshkins. The second wife of Thebian high priest Piogem II was placed in a contraption that made her appear to dance. The demand for mummies to take home was so high that Egyptians even started transporting them from less visited ruins to areas that got more traffic. Hundreds are now lost, as are their tomb locations. These gatherings thankfully died out in the later years of the 19th century, not because Victorians realized their inhumanity, but because of boredom. Because the Victorians were greedy, nothing filled their interest for very long, except occult and spiritualism. They put that bleep in everything. Books, newspapers, clothes, art, decor, parties. The modern spiritualism movement was generally agreed to start on April 1st of 1848 in 
Hydesville, New York, when teen sisters claim to speak to a ghost of a man killed in their home. News that spread worldwide and that had a complete fascination chokehold on England, causing the spiritualism movement of the 1860s and attracting people from different social classes, including Queen Victoria. The most popular forms of occult interest in the late Victorian period include mesmerism, clairvoyance, electrobiology, crystal gazing, specialty newspapers, public seances, thought reading, and above all else, conjuring. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, like many late Victorians, was fascinated by the possibility of communication with the departed souls. The core belief of their spiritualism movement was that the living could communicate with the dead through the help of a medium endowed with the supernatural gift during the mysterious and entertaining seance phenomena or performance. Charlatans will always take advantage after all. Within the late Victorian counterculture of spiritualism, a number of women and men gained fame and authority as skilled mediums. And now for the original garden gnome, the dirty old man in the backyard. See this? This is a gnome. If you're a basic B word, you might consider just tossing one of these among your flowers and calling it a day. No, you want this. See this? This is the dirty old dude that you would hire to live menacingly in your backyard. Why? I don't I don't know. Why not? I I don't have an answer for you. So yeah, uh, in the Victorian era, 18th century, wealthy families hired people to don full hermit garb, complete with robes, long hair, beards, and as Campbell cites from an advertisement in 1797, hermit is never to leave the place or hold a conversation with anyone for seven years during which he's neither to wash himself or cleanse himself in any way whatever, but is to let his hair and nails on both hands and feet grow as long as nature will permit them. These hired hermits would then lodge in shacks, caves, and other hermitages constructed on the homeowner's property, a rustic fairy tale manor or a creepy, I don't really know. It was a practice mostly found in England, although it made it up to Scotland and over to Ireland as well. But it originates in Rome. Emperor Hadrian had one of these at his villa in Tivoli as a thinking lodge, as did Pope Pius III. From there, it gradually verged away from religious devotees seeking isolation for themselves for spiritual reflection to a stinky dude lodging for an 18th century profession. It might seem like a whimsical garden feature, but it was all about that most celebrated Georgian England emotion, melancholy. Introspection and somberness of spirit were prized amongst the elite, and rules that they asked the hermits to play embodied this because they weren't able to do it themselves. The ornamental hermit vanished at the end of the 18th century to be replaced by these ugly little monstrosities. So go stomp on a gnome today, everyone. Number 10, tool skirts. Tool skirts were a major problem. Although these were chiefly worn by ballerinas, ballet has always been a destructive form of dance when it comes to basically how it affects the body. I mean, many ballerinas literally have their toenails fall off as a result of dancing on point. That's just kind of like an assumed part of the profession if you're dancing point. However, we aren't even talking about the feet here. We're actually talking about how safe the costumes are, the literal garments they dance around in, not even their shoes or their feet. The answer to that question, they're not very safe. Considering that before electricity, many danced on candlelit stages, you'd likely be horrified to hear just how flammable these costumes were. There are many examples throughout history of ballerinas and dancers getting too close to candle flames while in their costumes and basically lighting on fire. And I gotta say, I've listened to multiple podcasts that have talked about this, so I could recommend some to you. If you want some, let me know in the comments. I'll send them your way. Emma Livery is by far one of the most famous ballerinas though to have caught flame. She actually did initially survive the incident, but she died eight months later as a result of her injuries. That sounds terrible. And there were honestly countless others who suffered similar fates. The really terrible thing is back in the day, this is something new that I found out, we actually had the means to make fire retardant costumes. but. They affected the aesthetic of the costumes, making the costumes appear a little bit more stiff. So rather than try to save the more than thousands of ballerinas who died in even just a single year, we decided to opt for beauty over safety. To me, that's pretty scandalous, I'm gonna be honest. Scandalous and disappointing. <laughs> And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Bumblebee and you love learning history with us, be sure to let us know by clicking that subscribe button. Honestly, we got a lot of fun facts for you and I don't want you to miss out. Number nine, showing some shoulder. Ooh. <laughs> 
The crazy thing is we actually just came from an era before this when showing shoulders was actually considered very fashionable. But by the time the Victorian era really started to kick into gear, this was actually considered completely improper. Paintings even had to be repainted to reflect this new trend because showing a bit of shoulder literally frightened some people. They were like, oh, I can't look at it. Repaint that painting, cover those shoulders up. I'm not joking, that's a real thing. And don't even get me started on cleavage. Shoulders were previously considered to be something beautifully showcased from gowns that had both lower and wider necklines. This was considered beautiful and sexy in a good way. But with puritanical views taking over anything considered too beautiful and definitely anything considered sexy would be seen as bad and sinful. So we had to cover those shoulders up. <laughs> Man, if I traveled back to the Victorian era right now, they'd be like, girl, what you doing with those shoulders? Sorry, my shoulders and my ankles are out today. Oh, scandalous. Number eight, the gall dress. Well, Marie Antoinette was not around during the Victorian era, living and dying just before it began, really. Her presence was felt in regards to the mark that she left on the fashion scene. Marie Antoinette was often seen as a woman of scandal, not just because of the stories of her love affairs and her actually being misquoted here as responding to the poor, starving people of France by saying, let them eat cake but also because of her fashion sense. While by today's standards, Marie Antoinette would be seen as probably being overdressed among us, by her time standards, she was often seen as presenting herself as immoral, with many of her dresses resembling more undergarments of the day than the usual more modest finery and typical style. Case and point, a portrait that was done in her chemise style dress, known as a gall, by painter Vigie Lebrun, was condemned for how it portrayed the monarch. People actually admired Lebrun's work in terms of the painting itself, but didn't like the dress that she had painted the queen in, as they felt it appeared too intimate and informal. As a result, the painting was actually removed from display and Vigie was forced to repaint Marie Antoinette's dress into something more formal and fitting. Because it's just it's too risque. We were like, we can't look at the queen like this. It looks terrible. Repaint it. <laughs> I don't know why I'm making everyone British when we're in France, but there you go. <laughs> Number seven, fainting room. By today's standards, fainting rooms might seem quite scandalous. And while they were very fashionable back in the day, often being linked to corsets, at least so we think, in reality, fainting rooms actually had less to do with corsets and more to do with people's desires to nap without having to bother with all the business of undressing, getting in bed, getting back up, having the bed remade, and completely redressing. Instead, fainting rooms were a place where you could sneak off to for some peace and quiet during a busy afternoon or major social event or simply a place you could just go to rest for a bit without having to do the whole sleep time ritual that usually accompanied, you know, going to bed. What's more scandalous is the fact that the women who were known to actually faint back in the day, that is true, and even today, women still faint, people still faint, had this malady attached to corsets by physicians. Usually, of course, men back in the day who simply just didn't know what was wrong with these women to make them faint so much. So what did they do? They blamed corsets, of course. Although to be fair, corsets are notoriously bad for your health. But still, I just love that these doctors were like, I don't know what's wrong with this woman. Corsets, they make her faints, that's what it is. Probably iron deficiency, heat, being overdressed in the heat, there's a lot of reasons why people faint. Number six, Shields Green. This dye color became super popular in the Victorian era, but is also known for being literally made out of poison. If you're worried that women of the day didn't know that at the time, uh, nah, they were actually informed on this, yet they still chose to wear this color because, I mean, it was simply too gorgeous. Hey, it's worth it. A little bit of arsenic poisoning, no problem. It did cause symptoms of arsenic poisoning among those who wore the dresses dyed with this color because, I mean, it's dye, it's, this fabric is still rubbing up against your skin, still getting absorbed through your pores, but it actually caused even more harm to those who made and dyed the garments with it because, you know, they're the ones actually breathing that in and stuff. Yikes. Number five in the countdown is all about buggy dresses. The wealthy Victorians were very into the grandeur, looking to feed a fascination with culture, especially. Beetle wing embroidery was at a peak of fame in the 18th century India and was quickly appropriated by English visitors while military occupied the country from 1858 to 1947. Elytra, which is the hard casing over a beetle's wing, first appeared on dresses and experienced their first burst of popularity in 
England by the 1820s, though English women in India had likely been donning it since at least the 1780s. Material used was often white or other pale colors to help augment the reflective green tones of the beetle wing. This visual was made possible when Elytra was paired with Zardozzi, a gold embroidery style often done on colored cottons or silks. Victorians at least didn't appropriate everything about the art form. They made patterns and styles of their own for the dresses. Elytra was sewn onto the gowns in an imitation of live beetle patterns, a reflection of Victorian interest in naturalism and zoology. Not sure why anyone wants to look like they have live bugs crawling on them, but... Okay. Number four is the casual ball gown. One of the most notable shifts in Victorian time was that fashion began to be differentiated by gender rather than class. This reflected the changing roles of women in society. And let me say, every part of Victorian women's fashion seems tortuous. You start your day layering on long, crotchless underwear and tunics before strapping a metal cage to your waist. You then wear an average of six skirts over that, alongside bodices and corsets that would forever change the placement of your organs and potentially even suffocate you to death. The reported average weight of a Victorian dress when fully on could be anywhere between 14 and 22 pounds. But the risk doesn't end there. In fact, it was everywhere. It was estimated that between the 1850s and 1860s, 3,000 women in England died from their crinolines catching fire, as airy fabrics and hoop-supported skirts also allowed for plenty of air to circulate beneath a dress, which could also make a small flame grow out of control in seconds. In 1860s, the New York Times reported that 40,000 women worldwide perished from dress-related fires. Another common occurrence was to see them pulled into machinery after walking too close and having some of the skirts catch in exposed parts. Yikes. It's no wonder that the large ball gown crinolines phased out in the late 1800s, but then bustles came in and they were worse in different ways. While more practical as it was slim on the sides and the front, it required women to sacrifice movement and comfort in order to achieve a fashionable shape like the course it did. They began to alter women's spines, ribs, and organs over time as they required women to twist their bodies completely in order to be able to sit down. Overall, while movies and TV may make these beautiful gowns seem whimsical and ethereal, they truly were just death traps. Number three in the countdown is bird brained. I enjoy my puns, but there's a reason for that one. This trend was started by the notorious Marie Antoinette, a rebel in the French courts for her outlandish fashion and accessories. Amongst her pile of powdered curls, Marie was often seen with feathered caps and bonnets. While this look became an envy for women across America and Europe, the trend did struggle to take off initially as much of the aristocracy was perturbed by it. However, a trend is a trend, and eventually the English society was persuaded. They donned mainly ostrich, pheasant, or peacock feathers at first. Eventually entire songbirds were stuffed after their death and adorned these hats. By the late 1800s, the plume trade had decimated several species of birds, including flamingos, birds Birds of Paradise and rosy spoonbirds. Topping the endangered list were the snowy and great egrets, as at one point their pure white feathers were worth more than gold. Promoters of the feather trade knew what they were doing and also knew that the public didn't understand the carnage that their fashion was sieging on these animals. They held that wearing feathers and whole birds brought city dwellers closer to nature, that it improved people's awareness and knowledge of bird species. Thankfully, it's due to the inevitable public awareness and then disapproval that bird hat sales diminished and went out of trend altogether. Number two slot in the countdown is Paris Green. It seemed Parisian aristocracy had a chokehold on the globe with their trends. It's believed Empress Eugenie was to have worn a dress so stunning at the Paris Opera one evening in 1864 that it was featured in newspapers globally the next day. It was a deep yet vibrant green, one rumored to almost glow in darkness. The green of Paris quickly became the hue of the social elite. So how was Paris is green made and why was it so dangerous? The color was discovered when chemists combined copper and arsenic poison. The result was a dye brighter than all the other greens available on the market. Copper wasn't what gave this color its iconic nickname, however. Arsenic is a highly hazardous substance that causes skin sores, vomiting, diarrhea, and in some circumstances, cancers or death, as we know now. But they didn't. When factory workers' arms and hands began to wilt away from sores and decay that could only be connected to the dye, French and German governments enacted legislation prohibiting the production of arsenic-based pigments. It's the right thing to do. Meanwhile, the British government mainly ignored them. Even when Matilda Schreuer famously died of arsenic poisoning with the whites of her eyes stained green from her working in factories. This was deemed 
accidental poisoning by the government at the time. Paris Green remained popular in England until ironically it just went out of trend. It's a little bit of an abrupt ending honestly. No justice for those exposed in workplaces or compensation for suffering. But nothing takes the cake quite like the Victorian trend of looking dead, which is number one in our countdown. You'd figure people look dead enough as is inhaling arsenic and mercury from their clothes and shoes and hats constantly, let alone their home decor. But looking dead was the fashion of the day. This look was specifically modeled after how tuberculosis affected you. Pale skin, watery eyes, red lips. While this disease was decimating the lower status, higher status women recreated it with makeup and arsenic consumption. You heard me right. In order to get pale skin, women consumed arsenic. In order to not die from arsenic, the consumer had to follow a careful process, eating small doses to build up a tolerance. Now, arsenic is addictive, so if they at any point stopped the consumption, they would experience withdrawals such as vomiting, stomach pains, convulsions, hair loss, nervous system failure, kidney failure, delusions, the list goes on. Some women were stuck taking it for the rest of their lives. For the desired watery eye look, women would put citrus or even perfume in their eyes. Some went farther, using belladonna flower, also known as deadly nightshade, for longer lasting tears. However being poisonous, little wonder why blindness was a widely reported as a symptom of belladonna drops. No wonder it did such a good job. Red lip paint included? You guessed it, more poison. In this case, usually lead. All of these poisonous products would contribute to illnesses and facial decay. Death was of course a long term side effect of the usage once poisoning reached its crescendo. Suffice to say, while you may really want to fit in, some trends are not worth getting on board for, especially if they'll slowly melt your face off. Number 10. The Hobble Skirt This is a bad idea written all over it. The Hobble Skirt, also jokingly called the Speed Limit Skirt, was a dress with a very tight hand, making the poor lass who's wearing its movement, well, not having much of it. Can't have the wife running off from her home now, <laughs> even if that, you know, that meant the home was not a good place and men acted really bad back then. But no, you can't have her running away. Apparently though, some were so tight that it caused women to fall, and in some extreme cases, I, I can't believe this, those falls were fatal. What? Number 9. Muslin Dresses Honestly, I can see celebrities doing this today. Okay, so the female figure. It's sleek, it's curvy, it's gorgeous. Today a girl's got some options on how she wants to flaunt what her mama gave her. You go girls. But back then, well, not, not so much. Except for the muslin dress, apparently, which I find strange at the time since seeing a woman's ankle could give a guy a stiff neck for hours, if you catch my drift. Essentially, this was a dress that you had to wet first, like a, a gentle misting, if you will. Yeah, weird, right? And then you'd wear it out. Now, for the summertime, this makes sense, and honestly, I might support this myself, actually. See the curves, stay cool. However, some stories tell us of women who wore this during cooler weather and then got sick. Fashion over function, ladies. Be careful. That's a silly one. Oh, 40 below, I better wear my muslin dress. Yes, I'm just gonna walk out. <laughs> Number eight, ladies wear. Okay, this is a general one, but ladies dresses and wear in general was just ridiculous. I mean, I mean those big poofy dresses, it just seems like ladies had it rough. When have they not? Wear a dress that's too tight or so big you struggle to walk around. Not to mention the fancies of dresses have wire, wood cages and frames. Just making walking around more difficult because yeah, that makes sense. For me, anytime I wear formal wear, I keep an eye out for bathrooms. You never know when you need to go. However, I just can't imagine trying to squeeze the lemon in those bad boys. Whew, that would be difficult. To make matters worse, there are stories of women wearing just regular big poopy dresses and then getting in accidents at factories. And yes, it was gruesome. And yes, they didn't make it out. And no, there's no movies about it. Stop asking. Number seven, pestilence fabrics. Last time I was talking about the Victorian era, I mentioned a few points on fabrics with harmful and dangerous chemicals, which happened more than it should have. It shouldn't happen at all, really. It's kind of sad. Well, that wasn't the only fabric related issue that was out to get you back then. For example, wealthy people couldn't be bothered to do their own laundry. I hate doing laundry, I don't blame you. I'm not wealthy though. And sometimes would have them washed and taken away by launders who, well, wash clothes to the rest of the city. Being that clothes and washers themselves were poor, or that clothes were just mixed around regardless, well, that was an issue. There was a lot of sickness going around at the time, and, well, it was contagious. A lot of times, these sicknesses would cling to fabrics, and when given back to their customers, well, they could very well come down whatever London was feeling at the time. It doesn't sound like a lot of fun. I, I, I think I'll just wear more of my dirty stuff. I'll just wear my underwear for six months straight. 
It was white when I bought it. Not anymore, but it's okay. Number six, lead. Here we go again. Lead, just lead in general. It was used in so much stuff. Seriously, it, it, it's scary. Especially because they knew it was harmful. It wasn't a secret, they knew. Uh, I was gonna pick one leaded item, but I, I mean, I couldn't. I mean, seriously, I know this is a list about fashion, but it was involved in some clothes making processes. It was, it was in women's makeup, which that's also fashion. And it was in house paint, which I know that's not technically fashion, but it kinda is. Trust me, I used to mix paint before I was an internet comedian. I know the history of paint. Ask me your paint related questions in the comments below. I'm the guy you need to talk to. I mean, it was used in pipes too, and we drank out of those, it's just crazy. Now, it is one of those things that minor exposure to is fine, sure, but the thing was with fashion and beauty is that you probably would use said product every day, like the clothing or the makeup, and especially the makeup of the ladies. Lead poisoning symptoms include headaches, stomach pain, constipation, infertility, and memory loss. Yikes, that's not fun. We don't like that here. Number three is not for the faint of heart. They loved leeches. It may be crazy to imagine, but between the late 1700s and well into the early 1900s, there was a booming leech trade all across Europe. Leeches were shipped from Germany to America by the tens of thousands. England even had to start importing them from France by the mid 1800s as their own leech stocks were not even enough to supply their own doctors. Francis Bourseuillas believed that all diseases resulted from the excess buildup of blood and documented this belief in a medical journal that would subsequently caused leeches to become the go-to treatment in France and then later spread across Europe. This usage of leeches then became worldwide from there and so obscene that the creatures started to go extinct. However, what these quacks didn't know is that bloodletting was very, very, very rarely beneficial to any conditions and applying leeches often resulted in detrimental side effects such as blood loss, diarrhea, and vomiting or those with poor immune systems could even be exposed to hazardous bacteria and infection, let alone death from hemorrhagic shock for literally anyone they did this to. Eventually, the excessive use of leeches meant that they became too expensive to ship, too scarce due to the over farming to find, and medically obsolete in the face of new science that questioned the medical merits of bloodletting. Thank God. Number two doesn't allow you to touch where number one usually comes out. It's the masturbatory mental illness. Obviously, it's natural, normal, and well, fun, but the Victorian perspective of masturbation was nowhere near what it is today, as our old timely friends saw it as a serious threat to mental and physical health or even could kill you. Self love was seen as an ultimate evil, but beyond moralistic arguments, many physicians thought that every orgasm drained a man's energy. Married men were warned by doctors to limit the amount of sex they were having, while unmarried men were encouraged and urged to conserve their essence by avoiding sex altogether, particularly masturbation. Even wet dreams and uncontrolled ejaculation were considered as sexual dysfunction, as masturbation essentially became the male version of hysteria. So how did you treat this condition? Men had to stop masturbating. Fear and shame campaigns did what they do best and stimulated the market to provide quick quack remedies. They came in the form of anti-masturbation devices that looked like torture chambers. Most popular was the jugum, which was a metal ring attached around the base of a man's, you know, and then screwed on. If he was to become erect at any point, whether awake or asleep, the now inflated skin would make contact with sharp metal teeth that would dig in. Like I said, most popular. Consider how much worse these other options were for that to be the primo choice. A spermatic truss was essentially the first jock strap, but meant for every day. And the Bowden device fastened a little metal helmet to the end of a man's member that bound up into his pubic hair so that it would be ripped out should he become erect. I'm more than happy to keep going, but I'm sure more than enough people are wincing right now. Keep in mind, while these men were going through this to avoid masturbation, women were being prescribed it as a cure. Number one on our countdown may be a bit of a surprise, surgery. How could surgery be a questionable treatment? Well, it itself isn't, but the men performing it and their hygiene towards surgery were. Most famous is Robert Liston, said to be able to remove a leg in 30 seconds, he notoriously used his own mouth to hold scalpels, knives, and even once sucked the pus out of a woman's throat wound. According to medical historian Dr. Lindsay Fitzharris, surgeons never washed their instruments or their hands, and Victorian surgeons were known for wearing old surgery garments 
hands out of prowess, reportedly so stiff with old blood that they were nearly cardboard in appearance. Even the operating tables themselves were rarely washed down, and it was said a visitor to St. George's Hospital in London 1825 discovered mushrooms and maggots thriving in the damp, dirty sheets of a patient's bed. When asked why they hadn't complained, the patient assumed this to be the norm. And what about surgery in the moment? Well, the patients were conscious and undrugged as they were operated on, and surgeries needed to be fast as a result. One in four people died after their surgery, whether it was still on the operating table or from infections afterwards. But what about our buddy I mentioned, Dr. Liston? Only one in ten of his patients died. This was because of his speed. Time me, gentlemen, time me, he'd shout to the surgery spectators to put his legendary speed to the test. Sure, he did accidentally castrate somebody once because of his wild motions, but nobody's perfect. In fact, while he's remembered for being the first surgeon to use anesthesia, wash his knives, and invent a still used medical tool, he is the only surgeon to ever have a 300% death rate. I'd be remiss not to mention that during a leg amputation, his lightning speed reportedly cut off three fingers of the assistant who had been holding down the patient. Then, as he brought the knife back up, he slashed the coat of a spectator. The spectator reportedly died immediately of fright, likely a heart attack. Though the assistant and patient survived initially, like most who were treated in Victorian hospitals, they died not long after from infection, which was also just called hospitalism at the time because of how many people died that way. It's easy to say that going to a Victorian surgery or a hospital may have been as efficient as rubbing dirt into a wound. Starting our list off at number 10, the first postage stamp. Uh, uh, uh. Nice. Who's the first guy who licked the stamp? Why'd he do it, right? We'll start off with stamp facts. Why not? I know there's a couple pen pals out there that still use snail mail. That's cool. This one's for you. May 1st, 1840, the world's first ever postage stamp was sold, of course, for one penny. Pretty cheap, nice, we love it. The sale changed history. Now on the stamp was of course a portrait of one Queen Victoria, world's first ever profile photo for a letter. Here we go, they're like, oh, who's this? Who's this little person here? Of course this caught on, definitely caught on. More than 70 million letters were sent within the next year. And then that tripled only a few years later. And of course it thrived for 40 years. Do you still use letters? If so, write into us, write some fan mail. Forget the comments, write into us with a pen, with your autograph too, where you live. Yeah, no one's doing that anymore. Number nine, Alexander Graham Bell. I have no idea how phones work. I know it's vibrations and signals and I have to do this occasionally to help it out, but scientifically, nothing. I can't wrap my brain around this technology. Still, I'm 28 years old and I have YouTube, couldn't tell you. If I was sent back in time right now, I wouldn't beat Alexander Graham Bell. I would just watch him and wouldn't change history one bit. Guy's a wizard. On March 7th, 1876, Alexander Graham Bell received a patent on his invention the telephone, and just three days later, he made it work, somehow. The world's first phone call was of course to his assistant, Thomas Watson. Now I'm from the generation that had T9, and I thought that was bad. I also didn't have that, you know, one of these, where you have to like, go around and around a bunch of times. T9 was way worse than anything. You have to Morse code message all your friends. Ugh, we have it too easy today. Never forget about Alexander Graham Bell. Hit that thumbs up on your smartphone for Alexander Graham Bell. How? How does it work? Hello? Number eight, Queen Victoria's death. You may have heard the phrase, the sun never sets on the British Empire. Sounds very Westeros, doesn't it? Sounds like the British Empire is in an alternate universe or something, I don't know. But this is meant in a literal sense. On January 22nd, 1901, the Victorian era came to a close, of course, after the death of Queen Victoria herself. She passed away at age 81, and Queen Victoria was succeeded by her oldest son, King Edward VII. Now, at this time, the British Empire literally took up more than one-fifth of all of Earth's land. So the sun actually did not set on the British Empire. It's a real phrase. It's not just a fun bit there. Number seven, Queen Victoria's eighth child. First of all, eighth? Kudos. Here's a fact that we don't talk about enough. Let's do this. First of all, I have no idea what it's like to give birth. I hear the comparisons and what it feels like, whatever, and it makes me want to faint. It's like peeing a watermelon or something like that. It's, I'm gonna faint just talking about it. The fact that you can endure this pain is beyond me. And the fact that you want to as well, Kudos. Now imagine being the queen and having the public, like everybody, talk smack about you and how you decide to give birth for the eighth time. Yeah, April 7th, 1853, Queen Victoria decided to use chloroform as an anesthetic delivery. Now everybody at this point, that you know wasn't a scientist, they were sure to voice their opinions on the matter. It was a huge controversy, although this act directly spread the awareness of this medical advancement. I mean, yeah, it sounds, you know, they're like, yeah, don't do that. But can you do that? We don't really know. We're eating bread. Number six, grave bells. Oh, this one gives me chills. Here we go. In the late 1700s, cholera, 
bacterial infections and anything and everything was spreading. It was not an ideal time, wasn't very safe. Many were biting the bullet at this time, sadly, of course, being gravely ill. But with this came a dark trend, the safety coffin. Yeah. Just a backup coffin. These coffins, Lord forbid, you are buried alive, these safety coffins would allow the dead to rise again. Nice, like it's Michael Jackson's thriller. They would just come up and be like, oh, oh, oh guess who's back? Back in the Thames, here we go. All these coffins have extra comfort on the inside and a wire. This wire ran through the coffin and then attached to a bell on the outside, on the you know ground floor. So if a passerby or heard it, well, thy would know something's up. Folks would get creative with their safety coffins. I mean, you know, they'd personalize it. Like for example, a man named Robert Robinson from Manchester. He passed in 1791, but instructed his family and watchmen to open this special door that would reveal a layer of glass. So that's real haunting to find. Hey, come look at grandpa. Yeah, he looks good, eh? Patent number 81,437. It was actually granted to Franz Vester in 1868, and it was an improved burial case. Just a glass case with someone who may or may not be alive inside. 50-50. It had an air inlet, a ladder, and of course, a bell. The description of the patent says, if too weak to ascend by the ladder, they can ring the bell, giving the desired alarm for help and thus save themselves from premature death by being buried alive. So now I ask you, if you're walking in a graveyard and you heard a bell ringing, what, we just could start digging and be like, ah, I think I heard something. I don't know. Let's just disrupt this skeleton. In fifth place, we have job inequality. Come on, it's not enough to pay women less. We gotta give them the crappier jobs as well. The lowest paying jobs available to working class London women were matchbox making and sorting rags in a rag factory where flea and lice ridden rags were to be sorted to be pulped for manufacturing paper. Needlework was the single largest paid occupation for women working from home, but the work paid little and women often had to rent sewing machines if they cannot purchase just them. So where's that money going? These home manufacturing industries became known as sweated industries. The select committee of the House of Commons defined sweated industries in 1890 as work carried on for inadequate wages and for excessive hours in unsanitary conditions. Wow, I'm shocked. By 1906, such workers earned about a penny an hour. In fourth place, we have limitations on hobbies. Yep because controlling a woman's body, work, and forcing her to run a household and reproduce wasn't enough. Nah. Women's physical activity was a cause of concern at the highest levels of academic research during this time. Sadly, uh, here in Canada, physicians debated the appropriateness of women using bicycles. Remember that purity culture I mentioned a moment ago? Yeah, here we go again. A series of letters published in the Dominion Medical Monthly and Ontario Medical Journal in 1896 expressed concern that women seated on a bicycle seat could have uh, an organ Oh no. Fearful of unleashing and creating a nation of oversexed females, some physicians urged colleagues to encourage women to give up modern dangers and continue to pursue traditional leisure pursuits. Seriously. However, not all medical colleagues were convinced of the link between cycling and orgasms, and this debate on women's leisure activities continued well into the 20th century. In the early part of the 19th century, it was believed that physical activity was dangerous and inappropriate for women. Girls were taught to reserve their delicate health for the express purpose of birthing healthy children, and one of these considered benefits of the corset was to restrict respiration. Don't worry, I'll get back to corset hell and meths in just a moment. Furthermore, the physiological differences between the sexes helped to reinforce the societal inequality. An anonymous female writer was able to contend that women were not intended to fill male roles because women are, as a rule, physically smaller and weaker than men, their brain is much lighter, and they are in every way unfitted for the same amount of bodily or mental labor that men are able to undertake. Well, pardon me and my tiny brain. Can I be excused and paid to go sit on a fainting couch? In third place, we have corset trends. I'm gonna start this by making sure everyone knows that I'm emphasizing the harmful trends, not dismissing corsets as a whole. I'm personally a huge fan of corsets and various historical shapewear, since when worn properly, they're actually quite comfortable and beneficial to one's health and posture. Improperly worn corsets, or ones worn too tight, can cause a variety of problems. And my displays ribs are a sad example of that. Anyhow, allow me to continue before I sidetrack myself to infinity and beyond. Victoria and women's clothing followed trends that emphasized elaborate dresses, skirts with wide volume created by the use of layered materials such as crinolines, hoop skirt frames, and heavy fabrics. The ideal silhouette of the time demanded a narrow waist, which was accomplished by constricting the abdomen with a tightly laced corset. While the silhouette was striking, and the dresses themselves were often exquisitely detailed creations, the fashions weren't ideal. At best, they restricted women's movements, and at worst, they had a harmful effect on women's health. Physicians turned their attention to the use of corsets and uh, determined that they caused several medical problems. Problems. Compression of the thorax, 
restricted breathing, organ displacement, poor circulation, and uh, prolapsed uterus. Oh no, can't harm that baby making factory. Articles advocating the reform of women's clothing by the British National Health Society, the Ladies Dress Association, and the Rational Dress Society were reprinted in the Canada Lancet, Canada's medical journal. Nowadays, corsets are a choice, not a necessity, and I often prefer them over the more popular underwire bra. In second place, we have Magdalene Asylums. So Magdalene, As so Magdalene Asylums, also known as Magdalene Laundries, were initially Protestant, but later mostly Roman Catholic institutions that operated from the 18th to the late 20th centuries to house uh, fallen women. The institutions were named after the biblical figure Mary Magdalene, who in you know, earlier centuries characterized as a reformed lady of the night. The term referred to female sexual promiscuity or work in undesirable fields, young woman who became pregnant outside of marriage, or young woman who just didn't have familial support. They were required to work without pay. Apart from meager food provisions, well, the institutions operated large commercial laundries, serving customers outside of their bases. Many of these laundries were effectively operated as penitentiary workhouses. The strict regimes of the institutions were often more severe than those found in prisons. This contradicted the perceived outlook that they were meant to help women, as opposed to uh, punishing them. The last one known closed only in 1996, which is a year before I was born, so they went on for way too long. In our first place, we have Woman of the Night. During the Victorian age, women selling their bodies was a wide-scale problem in Britain. The very essence of it went against every moral value that was promoted during this time. Values such as, you know, chastity, prudence, and grace were dismissed and disregarded by fallen women. These women were led into this line of work for varying reasons, the most prominent being, you know, social and economic concerns. Upon entering into this world, there were several different avenues that could be taken by women, including military encampments, brothels, and, um, street walking. The number of women participating in this trade during the Victorian age was uh, staggeringly high. Although London police reports recorded that you know there were approximately 8,600 women of the night known to them, it has been suggested that the true number during this time was closer to 80,000. As a result, concerns were raised and the prominence led to several government acts. Goodness forbid a woman try and make money for herself on her own terms through selling something that would already be part of a dowry. This act would allow women to barter within the marketplace without influence of men who would often take their earnings and goods. And that brings us to the end of our list and I'm sure you can see the smoke pouring out of my ears. Oh gosh, what a scandal. I've been talking about women's undergarments, sexuality, and been paid to do so. I'm definitely a modern gal, and a queer one who is very happy to be living in the time I'm currently in. Sure, things are far from perfect, but I have rights over my body, and marriage is a choice, not a living. Getting us started at number 10 is top hats. A top hat is an iconic image. You can see them in old black and white movies or on logos such as Mr. Peanut. But why were top hats created, and why were they so trendy? Well, there's multiple reasons actually. Men and women were already wearing hats and bonnets to protect their heads from rain, wind, and the soot from local smokestacks. As a result, hats were already quite a trendy wear. However, the true reason for its popularity is what it represented. The top hat quickly became symbolic of status, power, and masculinity. From 1850 to 1900, men wore top hats for business, pleasure, and formal occasions. Certain colors were even associated with certain times of day. For example, a black top hat was for day or night, making its wear feel taller, more handsome, even suave. Some were even reported to be a height of 12 to 14 inches tall. Top hats, amongst other hats of this era, also required ridiculous upkeep, such as being brushed, boiled regularly, powdered, etc. They also tend to contain mercury poison. As time progressed, we found other ways to overcompensate as well as accessorize our heads, so it's easier to see why the top hat never made a comeback. Number nine in the countdown is women and their flirty fans. When you see a gentleman caller across the room, you may want to send him a hint that you're picking up the vibe that his top hat is putting out. What better way than subliminal messaging with an item you're already carrying? In Victorian times, women carried fans due to fainting spells, which were really just the result of their excessively tight and heavy garments, something we'll cover later in the video. In 1827, a fan maker from Paris, Double Roy, published a leaflet explaining the language behind the uses of a fan. Some examples were twirling the fan in the right hand meant that I love another. Meanwhile, drawing the fan across the cheek told someone special that I love you. A fan half opened and pressed to the lips gave permission for a kiss. However, it is rumored that the less romantic truth is that the fan etiquette, such as Duval Roy's leaflet, was invented in order to boost the sales of fans in the 19th century after they had fallen out of fashion following the French Revolution. Irregardless of rumors, it 
appears in olden times some people were using fans to get hot rather than cool down. Speaking of keeping it cool, next in our countdown at number 8 is bottomless underwear. While showing a bit of ankle may have made you a harlot, in the Victorian era every woman was walking around with crotchless undergarments. But these strange underoos were invented with a justified purpose. Due to the amount of fabric layers, steel crinolines and tight bodices and dresses, women of the era didn't really have time to spend an hour undressing before nature calls. By creating undergarments that had holes aligned with the wearer's groin, a woman's only mission would be to hoist up as many layers as she could before popping a squat. Don't be fooled however, that wasn't exactly easy either. Some of you may wonder, what happened if Aunt Flo paid a visit while a woman was wearing an open bottom undergarment? Well, in Victorian times, menstruation hygiene was perceived very different and women quite literally let it flow. If you want to learn more, search that one up on your own. As fashion evolved and women wore fewer and lighter clothes in the early 20th century, pulling down undergarments from underneath bustles and cages was no longer a nightmare, so the crotchless undergarment was soon abandoned once more. But now it does make sense why everyone loved the high kicking can can dancers in 19th century Paris. Morning garb, and I don't mean pajamas, is number 7 in our countdown. Known as the monarch of mourning, Queen Victoria influenced how grieving women dressed and behaved in Europe and the United States after the passing of her husband in 1861. She famously mourned him for 40 years until her own demise and started what's now known as the Victorian mourning etiquette. Victorian mourning etiquette came with elaborate rituals to commemorate their dead. It became normal to have incredibly elaborate and lavish funerals, curtail social behavior, and even erect statues and ornate monuments as tombstones. Mourning clothes were part of this and they were introduced for both sexes. Set to show a family's outward display of their inner feelings after the passing of a loved one, the rules for who wore what and for how long were complicated and often outlined in popular journals or household manuals. Call that a mourner's magazine. Jokes aside, men definitely had it a lot easier. They simply wore their usual dark suits along with black gloves, hat bands, cravats, or ties. For women, especially should she be a widow, there were different levels of mourning and garb to wear as you progressed out of deep mourning and into lighter mourning and so forth. Deep mourning uh, was of course black, but also made specifically was a crepe styling, a scratchy silk with a puffed crimped appearance associated with mourning as it doesn't pair with any other clothing. Right. The mourner would eventually stop donning the crepe and then stop donning black. This was called slightening the mourning before cloth colors eventually moved on to gray, mauve, then white until the mourning period was considered complete. Number six in our countdown is the human hair wearers. Fun because it rhymes but creepy for a whole slew of reasons. So what do I mean by human hair wearers? Well it was a tradition in Victorian era to don jewelry that had segments of human hair embossed, woven, or sealed into it. But for many Victorian people, the amount of hair involved in remembering loved ones went far beyond a little lock in a necklace. In stores and women's magazines, you could find patterns for wreaths made of hair and wire, often floral designs. Bracelets, brooches, earrings, and necklaces were also all very common. In its prime, human hair, jewelry, and decor was considered incredibly fashionable. It's even said that swapping locks of hair was a love token between women loving women or friends the way that girls today might wear friendship bracelets with each other. I guess if you need a trim and you were already late on a birthday gift, you could really just kill two birds with one stone. In fifth place we have Grave Robin. Now my first thought when I said that just now was Grave Robin the character, which only goes to show how much Repo the Genetic Opera has rot in my brain. One of the most lucrative side hustles of the Victorian era was grave robbing. And the fresher the corpse, the better. Medical students needed cadavers to study, so a black market of corpses arose, enriching adventurous thieves and uh, angering families of the dearly departed. The 19th century was also a fertile age of exploration. One of the most impressive discoveries were ancient mummies that the people of Victorian England brought home from Egyptian vacations. They'd invite all of their friends over for unwrapping parties, which tended to be rather grim spectacles that nevertheless delighted the morbid weirdos. Look, while I don't condone it, I wouldn't mind time traveling back to be a fly on the wall at those parties, since I definitely classify myself as a morbid weirdo. At one notable gathering for the unwrapping of Nescons, the second wife of Theban high priest Pinogem II was placed in a contraption that made her appear to dance. The demand for mummies to take home was so high that Egyptians started transporting them from less visited ruins to areas that had a lot more traffic. Hey, whatever helps the economy. In fourth place, we have garden hermits. So the next time somebody shows off their garden to you, make sure to ask where they keep their hermit. And if they don't have one, make sure to comment on how undignified it is. In the Victorian era, wealthy families hired people to don full hermit garb, complete with robes, long hair, beards, and hermit glasses, and live as an ornamental garden hermit on their land. The biggest rule of all though? 
No speaking to anyone on the property. And honestly, sounds like a dream job to me. Ugh, being paid in house to not speak to anyone and just be like a silly little decoration feature? Sounds like upgraded background work, and I will totally take it. Granted, that's if someone wants like a spooky, ooky gothic garden feature. I'm all yours. In third place, we have shock treatment. No, I'm not talking about the cursed as all get out sequel to Rocky Horror, but more people should be. I've only watched it once, but it does have some bops for sure. In the 19th century, Victorians thought electrotherapy could fix everything from gout to muscle problems. All you had to do was pay your local electrotherapist who shocked the problem area, but really all it did was leave a lot of people with icky scars. In more modern times though, it has been refined to work well for muscle issues, but it uh, wasn't always that way. In second place, we have weird face masks. Patented in 1875, Madame Raleigh's face mask was strapped to a woman's head overnight, three nights per week. That was how you do it, you followed the rules. Made of flexible India rubber, the mask could be filled with unguents and all matters of salves and bleaches to uh, treat the skin. However, the mask did have a second purpose, which was to make the face sweat all night long. Also called the face glove, the device would excite perspiration with a view to soften and clarify the skin by relieving the pores and the superficial circulation. Inventor Helen Raleigh claimed the mask could be used by persons suffering with certain forms of disease or afflicted with a bad complexion, which came in the form of cutaneous eruptions, blotches, pimples, freckles, or fugitive discolorations, and for clocked pores and capillary congestion. So, a uh, cure-all? Now, this mask became very, very popular and uh, led to some market competition. One improved overnight mask was made of flannel, while another complained that existing masks didn't allow for poisonous gases to escape, so she proposed layers of chamois and satin. And hey, if all else failed, Victorian women layered raw beef or veal over their faces before bed. I love a good face mask as much as the next person, but um, I think I'll stick with what I already know. In first place, we have corpse medicine. The Victorian era ushered in the tail end of corpse medicine, which was the practice of ingesting different parts of the human body to cure various ailments. One popular drink to cure apoplexy mixed powdered human skull and chocolate, while the most coveted remedy mixed skull with uh, booze to each their own. By the 19th century, most doctors had uh, moved away from this barbarous practice, but medical texts and cookbooks that explained you know, how to best repair a body part suggested that it was far from uh, dead. To get fresh supplies, people often went to an execution rather than a pharmacist, paying good money for the freshest of fresh products as recommended by a doctor that was shockingly not accused of being a vampire. I even found a recipe for uh, red fluid marmalade. And that brings us to the end of our list, and uh, people really used to do the craziest things. I'll stick to my modern traditions that are a little less uh, life-threatening. Starting off this list, in our number 10 spot, we have the Tichborne case. This was quite a bizarre legal case that captivated Victorian England in the 1860s and 1870s. It involved a claimant named Arthur Orton, who allowed that he was the long lost heir to the Tichborne baronetcy. Despite numerous inconsistencies in his story, Arthur managed to convince some members of the Tichborne family and a significant portion of the public that he was who he claimed to be. The case went to trial in 1873 and it became a media sensation with thousands of people lining up outside the courthouse to catch a glimpse of the proceedings. This was basically like the Victorian era's OJ trial or the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard trial, you know? The people wanted to know. Despite Arthur's conviction for perjury, the case continued to fascinate the public for years to come, and it became a symbol of the era's fascination with sensationalism and fraud. The Tichborne case remains one of the most infamous legal cases in British history, and is a cautionary tale about the dangers of believing in something without sufficient evidence. In our number 9 spot today, we have the London Beer Flood. This sounds like it would be quite a fun time, but it was anything but that, and instead was a tragic tragic event that occurred on October 17th, 1814 in the St. Giles District of London. At the Mew and Company Brewery, a massive vat containing over 135,000 gallons of beer suddenly ruptured, causing a wave of beer to flood the surrounding streets. The torrent of beer destroyed several nearby houses, killing eight people and injuring many others. The flood was so powerful that it even knocked down the wall of a nearby pub, trapping and killing some of the patrons inside. The London beer flood was caused by a combination of factors, including poor construction of the vat and overfilling it with beer. The brewery had a history of safety concerns and many of the workers were aware of the dangers associated with working there. Despite this, the brewery continued to operate and tragedy struck. The incident became the subject of much media attention at the time and it continues to be remembered today as a tragic and bizarre event in London's history. The victims of the flood were commemorated with a plaque on the site of the former brewery and the incident has been the subject of numerous articles, books, 
and even a stage play. Not sure the logistics of that one though. In our number eight spot today, we have the Victorian bicycle craze. This is a name to refer to a period of intense enthusiasm for bicycles that swept across Europe and North America in the late 19th century. The introduction of the safety bicycle with its chain driven mechanism and rubber tires made cycling a much more accessible activity for the general public. It became a popular mode of transportation and leisure activity, particularly among the middle and upper classes. The craze also had a significant impact on fashion, with women's clothing becoming more practical and comfortable to allow for cycling. It's funny to think of now because like it's just a bike, but at the time it was so much more than that. It's like how smartphones completely changed our lives in more ways than we probably even know. That's basically what the bike was like in the Victorian era. The bicycle craze had a profound impact on society and culture at the time. It led to the development of new industries such as cycling clubs, and it also paved the way for the modern transportation industry. The bicycle became a symbol of freedom and empowerment, particularly for women who were able to travel further and faster than ever before. The Victorian bicycle craze remains an important cultural and historical phenomenon that changed the way people lived, worked, and played. In our number 7 spot today, we have the Crimean War. The Crimean War was a conflict fought between 1853 and 1856, primarily involving Russia and an alliance of France, Britain, the Ottoman Empire, and Sardinia. The war was fought over various territorial and religious disputes, particularly regarding the rights of Christians in the Ottoman Empire. The war was marked by high casualties, particularly from disease and poor medical care, and it is often seen as a turning point in military medicine. The war also featured some of the first extensive use of modern technologies such as telegraphs and railways which greatly impacted warfare in the future. The war ended in a victory for the allied forces and it resulted in a significant shakeup of the balance of power in Europe. It also demonstrated the need for improved communication, organization and medical care in military conflicts and it had significant long term impacts on military and political strategies in Europe and beyond. In our number 6 spot today we have the East End Outbreak. The East End Outbreak was an outbreak of cholera in 1866 and was a major epidemic that struck the densely populated area of East London, causing widespread illness and death. Cholera is a highly contagious disease that spreads through contaminated water, and in the Victorian era, London's water supply was notoriously unsanitary. The outbreak was particularly devastating in the East End, where poverty and overcrowding made residents more vulnerable to disease. The outbreak led to significant changes in public health policy and infrastructure, as well as increased public awareness of the importance of sanitation and hygiene. The physician Jon Snow, which you know feels like a weird name to say when I'm not talking about Game of Thrones, but the physician Jon Snow played a key role in identifying the source of the outbreak, tracing it to a contaminated water pump on Broad Street. His work really paved the way for the development of modern epidemiology and disease prevention. The East End cholera outbreak remains a significant event in the history of public health and the struggle for social justice. It brought attention to the urgent need for clean water and adequate sanitation, and it helped to spur reforms that improved the health and well being of people in urban areas. Number five, corsets. Nobody wants a waist bigger than nine inches, said everybody in Victorian times. I, for one, can appreciate the female form and the hourglass figure. It's admirable, sure, but. That being said, I, I don't think we need to go so far to keep the female form in shape. The corset's a little too much. Corsets were those chest tightening, gut sunking, push all to mincemeat to the top of the pie apparel that went under every woman's dress or every fat dude in his 50s who wants to feel 29 again. I don't think I have to tell you why this is bad or uncomfortable. The human chest needs to breathe, and when something's that tight around you, well, you struggle to breathe. Uh, trouble breathing, fainting were not all too rare, especially in hot and humid climates. For my generation, you may recall Elizabeth Swan had issue with hers in Pirates of the Caribbean. And then she fell, and then Jack Sparrow caught her, and it was a good movie. But don't, the corsets, I just I can't get behind them. Number four, foot binding. While not exclusively done in the Victorian era, it was started in ancient times and continued all the way up until the 20th century, thus includes the Victorian era. A Chinese fashion tradition that takes women's feet and binds them and squeezes them until they begin to change shape. Oh, poor ladies. Again, I don't think I need to tell you that forcibly changing bone and muscle structure in your feet just for fashion 
is a bad idea. I think you all know that. For starters, it doesn't look right. After years of binding, the shape of the foot drastically changes. Secondly, the health risk of doing such is not worth it. Oftentimes, toenails fall off or become infected. Ugh, gross. Bones break and pierce skin. It's a bad time all around. Thank God we stopped doing that, right? Jeez. Oh, thanks. Number three, lard wigs. Wigs have been around for a long time. If you're a fancy politician from Washington, you wear a powdered wig, singing Yankee Doodle Dandy all the way to the Capitol building. Balding men, women, or really anyone can wear a wig. It's, it's really for everyone. What I'm getting at is it's been around for a long time and we've come a long way. Given enough time and asked to tell the difference, I probably couldn't. I, I, really, I really couldn't point out a wig if, if you showed me. So we're getting really good at it these days. That being said, in the Victorian times, wigs were quite common and were fashioned with a peculiar substance. Lard, yes. Imagine every day of the week without proper baths or showers and living in close proximity to the Thames River. And you take a handful of pig lard and just slather that in your wig to style it. Put a gross sound effect in there, just gross sound, ugh. Do you imagine the smell? This is the most offensive hair crime since frosted tips in the early 2000s. Those were a big mistake too, I gotta say. Not, I had them, but it was, there's only one man who can pull that off. And he's in Flavortown, you know what I'm talking about. Number two, German helmets. 1914 was the end of the Victorian era and the beginning of the modern era. It's actually a very fascinating time. It's kind of like modern meeting the past, really cool. Well, fashion just doesn't mean civilian. Anyone who's ever spent time in the Marine Corps knows that they gotta look their best. Wah, well, Marines. The Empire of Germany was no different in 1914, and a lot of German soldiers wore helmets with an ornamental spike, like a Koopa from Super Mario. I know you guys have seen the movies, you, you, you've seen them. Except the main issue here wasn't an overweight Italian plumbers jumping on their heads, uh, but the war and the enemy itself. World War I was fought in a lot of trenches, so it's kind of awkward when you can see a bunch of little spikes moving up and around the enemy's trench. It's also kind of dangerous to have an extra piece on your helmet as you can get caught in weird places like barbed wire. And yes, if you're wondering, sometimes they were used in the absence of a good melee tool. Yeah, you'd be correct, sometimes they did. You gotta do what you gotta do. Oh, brutal. Number one, French uniforms. More World War I, but it's still Victorian. It counts, I promise. While the spiked helmets were a very bad idea, they were shortly phased out. They learned their lesson. However, the French stood up and said, no, 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 I have a worse idea. Also, shout out to France. You guys get a bad rap for the war, but it's really your war. You guys rocked it, man. You guys are the best. Love France. Anyway, the French uniforms were a little bit of a mistake. In a classic case of fashion over function, kind of the theme of this list, they wore very bright and blue red uniforms. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but bright blue doesn't exactly blend into an environment, thus it made French soldiers a very easy target. Everything's like gray, black, and brown, and you're just wearing bright blue and red pants? Yeah, you're gonna, you're not gonna make it far, Chief. Okay, guys, that's gonna wrap it up for me today. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe here for more. Yes, we love that. We're almost 150,000 subs, man. Let's get it. Let's get it, baby! Let's start off with a title that describes the Victorians in of itself, melodrama. The Victorian era culture wasn't actually the whole fair ye black death blah blah vibe entirely. It was more like the Robert Downey Jr. Sherlock Holmes movies, where it's dark and gritty and the people are obsessed with death and corruption of religion and occult stuff. The word melodrama, literally meaning music drama, or song drama derives from Greek but reached the Victorian theater by way of the French who had adopted the interest during the revolutionary period. In Britain, melodrama became the most popular kind of theatrical entertainment for most of the 18th and 19th century, a period where more people went out to the theater than any other time in history. Melodrama's unprecedented popularity during the Victorian period owes its life to the diverse audience it could draw, working class to aristocratic, but it also the illegitimate theaters that had been forbidden by law to perform drama involving spoken word. Many melodramas were book renditions or artisanal written and often featuring gore or death and remained popular until the end of the 19th century. Looking for a less noisy affair, more somewhere to chat but also be entertained, why how about the music halls? Even more popular for their variety of singing, contortionists, illusionists, animal tamers, trick cyclists, ballet girls and more. These emerged in the 1850s and by the 1870s there were 
hundreds across Britain. The audiences chatted throughout the acts and they could be unruly, throwing things at performers like bottles, old boots, vegetables and even dead cats. In some halls bottles carried by waiters were chained to the trays and the orchestra was protected from flying objects by steel grills. While women initially weren't allowed in the middle class song and supper rooms, they were later encouraged to attend because people hoped that they would have a civilizing influence on the men. Who, who thought that? That's not why women wanted to go. Anywho, throughout the 1860s it became more common for women to perform in music halls themselves. Many married into aristocracy because of it, got hired onto big performers and went touring, or ended up modeling for magazines. Through topical songs, music halls played the political edge and kept their audiences informed and educated about their rights and about the current social, economic, and political issues or corruptions. The last two decades of the 19th century saw steady efforts to control and regulate music halls, with music regulation, performer regulation, enforcement measures to reduce alcohol and worker and girls, and slowly introducing higher paying audience. And since I mentioned alcohol, the Victorian era was one of mixology. Many of the cocktails we drink now we owe to the British advent, and mixology historians consider the time of the mid 1800s to prohibition to be the golden age of mixology. Cocktail bars today use recipes and techniques that derive or replicate what the Victorians used in mix. The term cocktail began to be used in the very late 1700s, with the first workable definition printed in 1806. The popular mixed drinks of the time were punches and warm spice drinks served in large quantities rather than individually prepared drinks. Industrialization and changing societal norms came the rise of the cocktail because more available ingredients, the availability of ice, and the societal change seeing men and women working class aristocratic socializing together in public. So emerged career bartenders. One of the first people to make a name for himself was the hotshot bartender Jerry Thomas. He's so responsible for creating the trend he's considered the father of American mixology. In fact, there was a gin craze of the 18th century and it highlights the Brits love of cocktails. The consumption of gin in Great Britain, especially London, was so high Parliament passed five major acts in 1729, 36, 43, 47 and 51 designed to control the consumption of gin. Whether at home, the music halls or the dirty smoggy streets, the Brits loved a good novel. Print culture in Victorian era was diverse, aided by relatively high literacy rates. There were hundreds of magazines and newspapers available at cheaper prices, so even the most lowly and humble could enjoy some writing, even if it was subpar entry level crap. The 1880s saw the emergence of the new journalism, which drew in readers with pieces of violent crimes and scandals in high society, aka the true crime podcast of the times. Then novels were a key feature of the Victorian print culture. By mid-century, Britons of all classes could afford and read novels. Some were aimed at the highly educated and well-off people, others at less educated readers looking for appealing and exciting stories. Penny dreadfuls and sensation novels seen at their best in the work of Wilkie Collins thrilled their readers, and Victorian novels were often long with complicated plots and many characters. Many of those by Charles Dickens are still read today, and the Penny Dreadfuls made it to the TV screen in the masterful three season TV drama. You guys should check it out. And where better to read my newest Mary Shelley horror than my bestest painted office filled with taxidermy? The Georgian era was one of rationalism, but a shift in ideology took place as this period transitioned into the Victorians. Their view aligned more so with the Romantics, who were intrigued with by mysticism and death. So, while they were a time of technological advancement and progress, culturally, Victorians were prone to bizarre habits and beliefs. Like when a human family member passed away, Victorians did an extensive mourning ceremony, like take pictures with the dead, sometimes wear black for years, sob and roll on the ground. So when a family pet passed away, it's not that much different, and it's common to hire a taxidermist to preserve the animal, giving them a second life, which reflects the Victorian belief that animals should be useful to humans even in death. Walter Potter was a celebrated celebrity English taxidermist, known for his dioramas of animals mimicking real life situations. Also famously known for not being an ass who killed his animals to create art, but rather receiving donations from local farmers to do so. In 1861, Potter opened his own museum to showcase his creations, and it remained popular until the early 19th century when people began raising questions about how ethical taxidermy was. Number five. Gym Day. Believe it or not, they were around 200 gyms all across Europe during Victorian times. Dudes were getting shredded. Why not? They're like, hey, we don't have dinner, but might as well just work out. These gyms weren't bright, they weren't open, they weren't well ventilated, motivating, safe, none of those things that you need today. No, Victorian gyms were reserved for the upper class. Uh, yes, of course, grab your pocket watch and your blazer, Ezekiel. We're doing some bench pressing today, I guess. Yeah, grab your monocle, for sure, you're gonna need that. These machines, also, they were not ideal 
built to work out, they were designed as antiques first, rather than, you know, their fitness purpose and safety purpose also. Like, half these look like saw traps. There's no way I'm gonna be bending my arm around any of these Victorian devices. Even the machines today at the gym, I'm like, no way, no thank you. Weak gang, here we go. Number four, beauty patches. Okay, we have to bring back beauty patches ASAP. Imagine like if a rapper had a beauty patch. Nelly had the band-aid, but we gotta have like beauty patches. We gotta like, you know, mix it up a bit. Bring back the facial feature game. These patches came in all shapes and sizes, of course, in the Victorian era. Even in this portrait from 1755, Joshua Reynolds painted Charles, the ninth Lord Cathcart, rocking a large beauty patch. That looks amazing. He does look like Nelly, honestly. He has like that motivational, like rapper kind of like, you know, he, he's, he's in charge and you can tell from the beauty patch. It's like that that's a lord right there with that one of those. Take it off, no lord. Put it back on, lord. The reason for these patches back then and sometimes having more than one is because they were commonly used to cover up smallpox scars. They were made out of silk, velvet, and they were applied with glue. So pick a spot and commit. It's gonna be there all day. These patches were dark black and they were meant to make your pale skin pop. Of course, pale skin back then made everyone faint. Pale, pale skin and long shoes, everyone losing their minds. The position of these patches could also determine your political allegiance. How funny is that? Historian Joseph Addison took note of these positions when he observed two parties from the 1800s. Now one party had patches on the right side and the other had the opposite. It's pretty, pretty amazing. It's a pretty easy way to flip jerseys, right? The other team starts winning, you're like, you know what? Check it out, now I'm on this side, prove it. Number three, chimney sweep. Ah, terrible jobs, here we go. I remember when I was younger, I had to sweep the chimney in the house and I loved it, I thought it was cool. I thought it was like a little safety, like secret room, I don't know. It wasn't safe at all, actually. It was just a dirty room. Had a little broom too. I always loved using that little broom. Little tiny sweeps, one at a time. Little tiny bag to go along with it, so gentle. This was a terrible job to have in Victorian London, obviously. Chimney sweeps were famously young as well. I can't say anything else there, but these guys were Young lads, history is horrible. Maybe that's why I was doing it, right? Because I could fit inside of the thing, that makes sense. 1840 was a good year, all things considered. A law was passed that made it illegal for anybody under the age of 21 to climb in and clean a chimney. I was 18 cleaning my chimney. I had no idea, I could have used this great law and got out of the whole chore, shame. Number two, Jack the Ripper. Unidentified to this day, who is he? How did he get away with it? And also, when are we gonna see a Netflix documentary on this guy? We have everybody else in this multiverse of killers. Where's this guy? We're gonna complete the image. Well, it's because we didn't find him. Jack the Ripper was active in the East London neighborhoods, primarily, and sadly, he would target sex workers at the time. He famously took the lives of five women from August to November of 1888, and they were believed to have been connected to Jack the Ripper, although some sources claim that he was active until 1891. It's hard to tell who's who and who's doing what. Again, this is also so long ago. There's no cameras. Hard to catch someone. Many believe Jack the Ripper had some anatomical knowledge due to the way that he left his victims as well, which is creepy. While there were some suspects, including a member of the British royal family, believe it or not, Jack the Ripper was never identified, so. Yeah, that sucks, really. We gotta find him. Can't, but we gotta. And finally, number one, mudlarks. Yeah, we'll get dirty for this last one here. Why not? Victorian London around the 1840s, it was a bit of a mess. Everyone was sick, a lot of sore throats, to say the least. The jobs that were available, they sucked. They certainly didn't help you, you know, survive. The jobs that were available had you catching rats and crawling in a sewers. One of the worst jobs to have was that of a mudlark. Now, as the name hints towards, a mudlark involved getting in deep in the mud and muck that would build up alongside the Thames River. Yeah, that dirty river back then. They're like, yeah, just go through the, the lining of that. See what's in there. Ugh. This one was reserved, again, for the younger folk with, you know, the, uh, the, the patellas that still worked, you know, digging in the mud, of course. Can't have an old guy in there. He's not gonna come back out. It was like working in quicksand. It was horrible. It was exhausting. Not to mention the chances of being whisked away by the river at any given moment. Yeah, it sucked. All for the slim chance of finding a pocket watch or some driftwood, rags, something, anything really worth your troubles. Well, I've been your host, Taylor McWaters. Thanks for watching this whole video. I know that's hard nowadays to watch an entire thing. I can't watch a movie or a video for the life of me, so thanks. That's great. Yeah.